uh, not everybody is into squats. <laughs> and uh, People exercising, trying to promote a lot of things, and very many times forgetting that actually uh, sports is so good for the person who is doing the sport uh, on a physical, mental uh, level. And uh, that's basically already, if people can get physical and mental health through and tries to be something bigger than that. But then again, inside sports, we find challenges. Last year, I had the opportunity. I want. saw any difference between herself and her brother. She, in her mind, she was always the same age and like she didn't think about gender. So she, she was the same and then her brother and they played and both developed quite similar. And um, both played in the same teams, at the clubs. They played in Peko, Honka, Oyeko, uh, Finland's maybe most successful clubs, both in uh, men and women football. And um, as you know, when you play on this deep level, um, my daughter or our daughter was um, in the in the under twenty one national team. My son won the Finnish championship three times in the youth, the uh, A and academic leagues. So you can say they were quite equal. equal with their success and they're playing the same clubs. And in Finland, you know, parents drive the children to the training, pick them up from the training, uh, because they're just, the schedule is so tight, they have school, they have this, they have that. Uh, and they have, like, at one point they had like 11 to 14 football events per week. 
because they played in the Piri Yoko, Yalo Yoko, in Ma Yoko. Uh, all of the coaches wanted to train with them. They played in their own team since they were quite young, already in a higher uh, age group team. Also, the younger age group wanted their help. So it was a lot. So I think without the parents' help to take them to everywhere, uh, it's, it's not possible. Um, I always had to drive my daughter at a later time to a more far away place than my son. <laughs> Even though they were the same level, they were in the same class. My son trained at 6 o'clock in the Hong Kong main field. <coughs> and this was an ESCO club. And then my daughter, seven o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, <laughs> somewhere, be like the king or something. So, so there, there's the first difference. And of course, the difference is also the quality of the field and the risk of injury. And uh, then the other things that turned people off was, of course, mobbing and uh, harassment. And, uh, and, 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 and that was the biggest part. And there was even, like uh, they say, uh, what would you say, white Finnish people who said that I can't stand it how my mates are harassed and I don't like it anymore and I don't go to sport. So if we really think about like this big thing, sport, and these great things they can do, and then we, we are interesting only for 30% of the people. Seventy percent to get them into sport is really hard, but already then we turn off fifteen percent who are basically interested and have been into it. Uh, it's it's a, uh, uh, it's a big 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 shame. And um, <clears throat> what we have to see here is that sports, like a church or army, is their own world. They have their own jurisdiction, they have their own disciplinary committees, they do their own rules, uh, they try to settle their issues in their own circle. Very rarely goes anything, it has to be really, really uh, clearly criminal that something goes to the uh, court. It all stays inside. And, um, that is an area, this is a very big risk that in those kind of closed societies, within a society, uh, development doesn't always go <coughs> in the same way than society. And uh, there is also those risks in sports. And uh, if I only think about um, the sexual harassment, sports has for the hard fight not to make uh, checking a uh, young girl's coach, history, police records, it's voluntary. Sport depends on, on volunteers. It's very hard to get volunteers. So they rather don't upset a, a volunteer by checking his background than to make sure the children are safe. Uh, these are the kind of things that, as a sport person, we cannot do. And um, <clears throat> you know that I have worked with, the, worked with the football federation and with the district and with everyone, and I feel like a sport person, I feel like a football person. And uh, criticism is not always seen as constructive. It seems like uh, uh, you're the enemy. Um, even more from within, but then also from, from without. Um, I think people should appreciate the role of a watchdog. Because a watchdog keeps you from making mistakes. And the watchdog helps you to do better and be more successful. And be number one in how you run your things. And if, you, if we think of it in a holistic uh, way, uh, in the long run, we cannot be number one only in one thing. We cannot 
think that we will train so well or have so great tactics that we will, will win and make all the points and, and we will have great football and everybody will participate when that is the only area we take care of. I think in sports we have to take care of the whole, everything, um, every aspect to be really great. Um, <clears throat> well, when I saw my children growing up and working with those youth teams and youth clubs, and I was thinking about homophobia, uh, I must say I had a good impression. Because um, my daughter told me, yes, in her teams, 60% of the players are lesbians. And my son was a, and it wasn't an issue for them. Uh, at this, at this, and at that time, and my daughter was very young when she started. Uh, she did not consider herself lesbian or bisexual. Uh, so one issue was when they celebrated a, a win, and the majority of the team wanted to celebrate in the gay bar, and she wanted to uh, hit on some boys. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a small issue <laughs> uh, that, that annoyed her. Why can't we not go to a bar where I can even um, uh, the, the boys in, in my son's team, because they knew about the girls' teams and they knew uh, that it was quite a normal thing, and so for them it was also like a normal thing. They, they uh, were friends between the boys' teams and the girls' teams, and it wasn't, that, it wasn't an issue. So I thought, like, wow, this is great, you know, like, uh, the young generation, uh, uh, they will be relaxed about this, it will not be a topic, it will be just fine for everyone, uh, the way they are. But then, of course, later I heard uh, about cases here and there, you know, when somebody uh, came out and they got uh, messages from teammates, you know, I don't want to be with you anymore, I don't want to play with you. So, uh, I thought, whoa, still not. I was thinking, I was maybe seeing just one ideal situation, but it's not like that everywhere. And, um, and then the one thing that bothered me also was that, um, even though we knew, and this means basically everybody knew, uh, the Federation doesn't talk about it. Uh, Players still can't come out, uh, and of course, players, active players, uh, very rarely, and that's also concerning the, the victims of racism. They cannot, they cannot go out and say, "I'm a victim." They have to be winners. They have to be cool. They need this uh, nimbus. It's all around them. They can't go in the public and, you know, crying about it and I'm a victim. And this is a big, big problem when we have, uh, we have seminars, we have conferences, we, we, we bring on stars, <coughs> big stars to talk. Active players, they can't talk. The most they will say is that, yes, I have seen it with others, but I, I have never experienced it. I've heard that in, in seminars and meetings and conferences around Europe hundreds of times. The former players who still have a big name, we need them to come out and speak up um, about discrimination, about the things they have suffered of in their career. That's taking responsibility. I hope that uh, in this seminar, as I said, I have seen hundreds of seminars. It, there is a glass ceiling we all want to break. Um, but still, we, we obviously we don't do it with one push and one move. We do it step by step, and today I hope we all are going to take another step and of course, if anybody comes up with a grand idea that we can 
go to a new dimension, <laughs> that will be just very welcome and we should all support that. Um, one thing that's coming up is the uh, elections of a new chairman in the Football Federation. There's still time now to register. Maybe the next chairman is sitting in this room. I don't know. Let's find a woman and uh, encourage her and support her. And let's make some changes because that's what we can see. We, we can talk about feelings and they're important, but we cannot argue on feelings because we cannot prove them. Uh, but we can prove how many leaders are sitting in the committees, how many leaders are sitting in the, in the Federation, how many people are in responsible positions. We have hard proof here. And there is something we can, something we can show and we can argue with. And let's start from the top, because this kind of change has to start from the top. If the leaders are not into it, it will not happen. So I wish you all a great seminar today. And enjoy. Hän ei tänne ei paina ja moi on 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 ja on moi 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 on pelannut ja I will take something in English maybe because it's easier. So I'm going to be the moderator today and I'm very, very happy to be here, take part in this seminar. And I have been playing football many years, so I have seen a lot because I have been, yeah, yeah how many years? Uh, 20, 20 something. So that's quite a long way to go and even in the um, highest league in Finland and seen or played many years in Sweden and then also in the national team. Been already quite many years from 2006 so I have seen seen a lot during the years and yeah today we're gonna talk about a lot uh, of yeah, women in football in Finland and also something from yeah, how things are going in, in the world in general and uh, yeah i'm happy to be here and uh, should we start with um presentations yeah before we go to the panel together yes so first i'm going to ask isaac yusuf Aramir to come to the stage yeah. <laughs> uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Isa Tutumere. I'm originally from Nigeria and I was a test international football player. I played for the Nigeria national team for about nine years. And I've played in three different uh, World, Champ uh, World Cup Championship. Also, I've won three African gold medalist tournaments in Africa. And I was at the uh, Olympic in Beijing 2008. Actually, I played in Finland for like six years in Nice and Media with different clothes. And she was one of my favorite. <laughs> I get a good nice for this, I think, to get in the same It was fun for me too. Uh, also, uh, at the moment, uh, I play also in Sweden before I started from playing like a football. Uh, at the moment, I'm a football coach and a sport instructor. I coach three different teams. Um, WPS United, age 18 to 16 years of girls. FC4 boys, age. 11 to 12. And also, I coach in Hena Rico, a multicultural women group, as a football coach, and as well, I'm working with Hena Rico to support instructors with different groups. 
I'm also in the board of uh, Labour Can Support for Her. And also, I'm in the board of uh, working on trying to do some life stories and discrimination. Um, Fair Network is actually uh, the short form and the name is the name for is Football Against Racism in Europe. And they are really doing a lot of <coughs> great job to you know, tackle discrimination, such as minorities and many other stuff in football, this especially for this women aspect. And I will start by, at the moment I'm here to represent Fair Network. Uh, I first actually set up the counter discrimination in European football. Fair also our membership based network in Europe and active globally in 40 different countries. Fair also have um, partnership with UEFA and in cooperation with, with FIFA. Uh, the aim of Fair is fighting discrimination in football, promoting uh, equality, diversity, and true sports, tackling discrimination through football. Fair is a very big, well, Fair have a very big event coming up in this month. It's actually two weeks event. Of course, it started already, but we have our own event here in Finland this Saturday. Of course, some other groups have already been their part here in Finland. Uh, it's a very big event, and the biggest activities organized by Fair with more than 2,000 events and in 50 different countries around Europe. And during this um, football action um, event, I'm always fully really involved because for me it's a very important thing. And it's the event that brings a lot of people from different backgrounds, different orientation, to bring a lot of people together and to celebrate each other and to integrate as well because I understand like when I was playing football and now it's, it's very different. And like what Kristen was saying before, that we need to empower more women, either in the grassroots, in the football clubs, in the national team and every other aspect in sports. I think more women have to be fully involved and we need to support each other and to empower them as well. And also, first support and promote minorities, we promote our refugees, social, in social inclusion, and also LGBT. And from my uh, understanding and from my perspective, I think about LGBT, I, I know much about the UK. Fair are really involved in that because uh, there are a lot of challenges in different countries, a lot of condemnation and discrimination about sexual orientations, which I think we have to try to work on top of. That is uh, very effective because somehow it's getting a bit of hand and if you don't try to work toward this at the moment, I think you're not going to like, help the younger ones come to play football because somehow when you do different kind of sports and you know, you're kind of being discriminated, oh, you cannot do this because it's for the men or the boys, or you cannot play, play this sport because it's you have to be for the girls. Now, we as a person, we have different experience, different backgrounds and different activities when we're doing it. So I think when we put this Thing into um, consideration, it's really good to uh, you know, work well and also to support every other people that want to do sports. Because for me, I think I believe everyone has the right to do every, every kind of sports that you want to do or you wish to do. Maybe you are a male or female or bisexual or whatever. The most important thing is how you feel about what you are doing and how it affects and impacts your life in the areas of way you are doing the stuff. Uh, but if you want to get more information about Fair Network, uh, it's also on the internet, it's on www.fair.org and there you can find more activities and more events about Fair uh, program and um, other stuff there. So thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. You have gone also a long way and had had great experience. It's hard to come from here to be a top women player. So nice to have you here. And the next one we have Celia Kanta from Palerito. And you are also with the Gangs and Walk Company. So I noticed that <laughs> welcome, but yeah, mostly gonna talk about how how it is. Yes, thank you. Um, I was thinking if we could have a, a, a presentation along. I would like to know who you are. And if you can, if we keep it short, mention your name and then maybe the organization you know, from. Maybe you're just here for the 
interest or if you don't want to mention the organization, that's fine, but we we'll continue. Let's start from there. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Serapa and I work for Mona Liku. Hi, I'm Lisa, also work for Mona Liku. Hi, uh, this is Priya. Uh, I'm doing web practice in Mona Liku. I am Mariangela and I am practicing from Monaco. Okay. I am uh, Anna and I uh, give to represent the University of Nebraska last year. Okay. I'm Nicola. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm calling my father. Okay. Okay, I'm uh, Thomas Summer. <clears throat> I'm actually wearing a double cap here because uh, for many years I worked in different capacities at, in the African Association of Central Finland, Kesky Swomen uh, uh, African Institutes. And uh, three years ago, um, we had this collaboration with uh, Mona Liku to assist our women uh, uh, in doing sports in uh, Yuvatsula in particular and Central Finland. And then at the same time, we also have it with the men with the Likuka, we are collaborating with the men with Likuka so that in uh, Central Finland there, there can be sports, multicultural sports, bringing in uh, all the different immigrant groups together in Yuvaskula. So uh, at the same time, uh, I'm a board member of Likuka and I'm here because uh, on Saturday, actually when we have this um, uh, sports week, I, I, I did put uh, those posters. I'll be traveling to Yuvaskula because there's going to be sports for women and a tournament, tournament for women and also for men, you know, to celebrate this um, sports uh, week with the, with the support that we, we receive through these posters and other things from uh, Fare. And uh, so this is very important because uh, we've been doing a lot of work in this area in central Finland to promote integration yes. through sports and uh, Mona Liku on the side of women and Ikuka on the side of men have been very supportive because uh, we have never received any funding for the work that we do, but um, we do it, and uh, this actually uh, you know, promotes uh, cultural cohesion in Central Finland. Thank good. you. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. My name is Tina Tikkan, and I'm just here because I'm in interested in this topic, and but I have also played quite many years, uh, and about 25 years ago in U.S. school in a team called E and F, US could a nice put this. Uh, one only one team for women. All all the uh, club or team. Yeah. So I wonder if they would uh, allow me to be put in creating No, it's it's uh, well uh, already uh, twenty years ago they formed a part of uh US and what is it? Oh okay. Here they go. Yeah. So that's uh, team doesn't exist anymore yeah. as such. <coughs> oh, welcome. The gentleman in back. Uh, I'm Sean Akalinge. I'm working with Liku Gallery and we're um, conducting a similar project in the sport club in Refugee. And my interest in this woman topic is uh, that uh, uh, a lot of women who come through the refugee centers and reception centers don't have these activities going on, so providing us with that project. Okay. Thank you. I'm Samuel Villanen from uh, Lego Club. Hi, Satya Soon. Oh, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Samuel Villanen, I'm a director of Mona Lego. Yeah, I'm interested in this topic for a long time. I noticed that it's a need to do this work also in Finland, not in other countries. I think this should be done in all the time. Uh, I, I want to market our big event that's coming this Saturday. It's uh, it's called Football for Refugee Women. It's in Hoa Sarena near the, near the Olympia Stadium. It's a festival where we celebrate, you know, the diversity of football. It's, it includes uh, only women for football tournament and many other activities if you're interested to come back. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Linda Rodo. I'm one of the panelists today and uh, I play Rodorico. 
and that also done um, a master's thesis about like women's representation, representation in the media in sport. So, interesting. I'm here because I'm working on thesis. I have the deciding what to do with women sports, and uh, my teams are in the policy around for equal, and I'm also uh, studying sport management as well. Okay, hi, I'm Rika, and I'm going to give a presentation later, but um, I have to say that we have this kind of team in Boris still that has only girls, nice mm -hmm. uh, I call myself ex-player, I still play in second division, but I don't practice or anything, so it's just... <laughs> I'm here, a player. Yeah, reading it there. Player. Yeah, they are. We need to be careful. What is <laughs> yeah, after the name. Yeah. But I'm here uh, representing University of Duke. So yes, that's good. I prefer researcher now. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Uh, <coughs> please don't mind my read from the paper. Uh, just to. Remember, I remember to say what I wanted. Uh, it's really short, and uh, as it in English, as long as it helps me, that is from the paper. Um, oh, my name is Silja Ranta. I'm a manager of uh, Club Development in Kupo Association of Finland. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here with all of you. The amount of football players is increasing 5-7% yearly, uh, including women and girls. Uh, the number of registered female players is now 32,000. That's a very significant number. For example, all the other sports together uh, do not have the same amount of female players. Therefore, we can honestly say football is number one sport for girls and women. Especially the number of women playing so-called hobby league, Carlos de Saria, seven aside, is increasing in Helsinki by 44% in 10 years. Also increasing number of people are interested in women's football. For example, 400,000 people watch Euro Cup 2017 final on uh, telly last summer. In addition, in nice Liga, uh, the audience increased by 14% this year. At the same time, we need to remember that the steps mentioned are rather small and the quality still varies a lot. Too much. Therefore, stage of women football cannot be summed up uh, in one sentence. There are huge difficulties, uh, no, <laughs> difficulties, sorry. There are huge differences in clubs, age group, areas, etc. One key factor is to inspire clubs, include women's football in their overall development plan, to make it natural part uh, of all they are doing, involving administration, coaching, marketing, uh, etc. So that it wouldn't need to be mentioned separately. Power of words. What does it mean? Why do we use that word? Do we also say miesjalkapallo then? Should we? Should we start saying just football? Or naisten jalkapallo, women's football? Or do the words matter? Arsenal ladies changed their names to Arsenal this year. Officially, they were called Arsenal Women. Uh, officially, they are called Arsenal Women, but called only Arsenal every time possible. By doing so, Arsenal wanted to show that they are one united modern club. This change of words was considered as a significant step in football history. In Finland, the name of, of the age groups, Ikaluokka, Permit <laughs> mm, uh, change to be equal this year. A very small step, but a good beginning to equality in football terms. 
We need more women, as Christian said. We need more women on the decision making. Uh, as this is uh, on the decision making level for better governance. And this is just a note. This is not political opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking part of the, the, our uh, chairman election or chairwoman election <laughs> because I'm an employee, so it's uh, against the rules. Okay. And I want to keep my job. That's <laughs> <perfect. laughs> So um, uh, we need more women on the decision making level for better governance. For example, we have only one woman of eight board members in Helsinki district. That's a shameful, shameful amount, isn't it? However, I also know that there has not been more women applying. Why? How, would it, how do we change that? Recent years, uh, Finnish FA have educated women in leadership to inspire and encourage them to apply for higher positions. Also, in capital area, we have started women's group for networking and peer support. Once again, small steps, small steps to the right decision. Oh, sorry, sorry. Once again, small steps to the right direction. Thank you. So we will continue about this. This thing is later. And then the next one is Rika, I am researcher. <laughs> so welcome. This is I have prepared this in Finnish, but I do have some examples in English, but I'm going to speak Finnish now. Naisurheilijat mediassa, kun näette, tässä edes puheenvuorossa tuli jo viittaus tähän, että tarvitaan sitä naisketuliin, että on tässä tämän kaunisen vinkillä nyt korostettu ehkä, ehkä vähän ironisestikin. Mä tulen tosiaan Turun yliopistosta fyysisesti Porissa, meillä on siellä ruonisten tiedokunnan yksikkö. On siellä Itäisen kulttuurin yliopiston lehtynä pääasiassa, opetan näinä päivinä, tai vähän aikaa on, niin mielellään tutkin sosiaalista mediaurheilijoita tällä hetkellä, jostain kumman syystä se on tuonne naisten joukkueurheiluun ajautunut se, se tota, näkökulma näissä. Mulla on tässä nyt ihan viime päiviltä esimerkki, joka tavallaan tiivistää aika hyvin tämän, mistä tänään yritän pysyä ajassa nopeasti juosten alustaa hieman, eli tuota, siinä oma entinenkin joukkuetoveri niin Anna Auvinen, joka ratkaisi Suomen mestaruuden näyttävällä tavalla tuossa lauantaina. Harmi kyllä peliä joutui katsomaan Veikkaus TVltä, että se ei mistään yleisesti, yleisesti TVstä tullut Veikkaus TV, kun ei saa peilattua edes telkkariin, niin joutui katsomaan mobiililaitteelta pientä kuvaa, mutta kuitenkin näki edes sieltä. Ja, tuota, Uh, toki maks ma maksullinen siis veikkaus teille pitää laittaa rahaa peitille, jotta nämä pelit sieltä aukeaa. Mutta tosiaan uh, ihan huikea, huikea päätös kulta ratkesi siis viimeisellä kierroksella uh, hongan eduksi. PK olisi tasapeli riittänyt, mutta auvinen vanha hyökkäin nostettiin kärkeä ja viimeisellä minuutilla uh, puski. Maalina tuli siinä vastaan ja maalioihin ajelemaksi samalla ja tässä lopputulos, mitä hän sitten näyttää. Näytti pelin jälkeen, että se on vähän päivänä illalla. Kyyninen mediareilututkija sanoi, että pitääkö murtaa suurin piirtein koskiluu, että pääsee otsikoihin naisjoukkueurheilijana Suomessa. Mutta toisaalta mä ehkä yritän olla vähemmän kyyninen ja musta tässä on toisaalta niin kuin... Oli se, että tuodaan esiin lasia, jos sieltä oikein haluaa kaivaa, että naisurheilu, naisjalkapallo on, että kun sieltä miesten jalkapallossa, niin luultavasti miesten puolelta olisi voinut samanlainen otsikko nostaa äh, iltasanomiin, ja tämä on itse asiassa yleiltä. Äh, mikä tässä on erityistä, tai ei niin erityistä, vaan normaali toimintaa valtamediassa, että on nostanut FC Hongan naisten Instagram-päivitykseen uutisiin, eli tämä kuvahan, joka on jotain, niin se oli Hongan tekemä Instagram-päivitys. 
niin illan aikana on muokkautunut. Tämä on aika tyypillistä, eli sosiaalisen median puolelta nostetaan valtamediaan, kun he uutisiin yhtäjään. Mistä tietysti piilee se mahdollisuus, että ne marginaalisemmat lajit tai ne naisjoukkueurheilut, urheilijat, jotka ei muuten saa sitä valtamedian huomiota, niin oikealla tavalla sosiaalista mediaa käyttämällä sa saattaa saada nostoja sinne, mikä ei tietenkään ihan teidän tilanne ole, mutta kuitenkin meillä on se sosiaalinen media nykyään, jota, jo jonka kautta voidaan ehkä vaikuttaa. Mä tänään puhun ö, lyhyesti, yritän jostain läpi noita omia tutkimuksia, mutta tässä nyt ihan kansainvälisesti, siis mediaohjelma on tutkittu vuosikymmeniä, erityisesti sanotaan, kun tuossa 80-luvulta alkaen, nimenomaan sitä, miten sukupuoliseksuaalisuus ja etnisyys, tämän kaltaiset asiat on paitsi jossain mediaurheilussa tai miten ne niitä esitetään stereotyyppisellä tavalla. Uh, urheilumedia pelaa varmaan päälle tietysti, kun se syöttää ulos sitä, mitä oletettavasti yleisö haluaa nähdä Suomessa. Miesten jääkiekko on näin vähän kärjistetysti. Mutta mitä, mitä jos kokeiltaisiin joskus jotain muuta, koska se mun argumentti on se, että miten sä voit kiinnostua yleisönä jostakin, jota sä et koskaan missään näe mediassa. Eli, eli tämmöinen, tämmöinenkin näkökulma tähän voitaisiin ottaa, mitä se tarkoittaa sitten siellä urheilijan ja urheilutoiminnan tasolla, on tietysti se, että kun ei ole medianäkyvyyttä, ei ole sponsoreita, ei ole käytännössä katsoen rahaa pyörittää sitä toimintaa. Eli tämä ei ole nyt vaan se juttu, että olisi kiva, että näkisi sitä naisten jalkapalloteatta, vaan tietysti sillä on niin isommat vaikutukset. Tässä puhutaan tuolla mediaurheilututkimuksen puolella naisurheilun noidan kehästä, mikä pitäisi nyt saada sinne pikkuhiljaa apua rattaisiin. Yksi näkökulma on tietysti, että pikkutytöillä on naisroolimalla ja itsekin aikanaan veikkausliikaa seuranneena niin oli näitä brasilialaisia ensimmäisiä miestä, jotka Suomeen tuli tuo porissa pelaa, niin nehän niitä mun idoleita oli pieniä. No, tähän on tullut se sosiaalinen media. Nykypäivän onneksi tytöillä, pikkutytöillä vanhemmillakin on mahdollisuus panittaa urheilijoita, naispuolisia urheilijoita siellä sosiaalisen median puolella. Joo, sitten nopeasti näitä omia äh, tutkimuksia. Niin mä oon jo 2009 tutkinut silloin, silloin tätä naisten EM-kisat pelattiin Suomessa. Mä sain Pauliitolta silloin ison mediaseuranta-aineiston, plus mä seurasin kaikkea, mitä verkossa tapahtui kisojen aikana. Niin tähän nyt voi, voi tiivistää sen, mitä, mitä se oli seitsemän vuotta sitten. Eli täytyy sanoa, että on vieläkin aika tyypillistä. Sieltä naisurheilijoista nostetaan esiin tai otetaan siitä urheilukontekstista ulos ää, valtamediassa kiinnitetään huomioon johonkin ulkourheiluiseen asiaan. Äitiys, vaimous, tämän tyyppisiä. Vieläkin näkee tosi paljon. Eli, eli Laura Stebrett-Kalmari silloin, silloin oli tämä, tämä supermamma ja hänen ympärilleen se uutisointi hyvin pitkälti silloin rakentui. Se oli paljon muutakin. Tietysti oli, oli tota, englannin ja liitmasia ja tämän tyyppisiä vertauksia tehtiin. Miesten, miesten jalkapallon maailmaa kisojen aikana ja näin. Ja se ö, edelleenkin urheilu sellaista, että saattaa sanoa, että naisten jalkapallot on, että se on kolme äitiä yhtä aikaa kentälle. Mutta on kuultu, että jossain mestareiden ja miesten perissä, että nyt se on kolme isää kerta kaikkiaan kentällä samaan aikaan. Tämä on edelleen ehkä sellainen, sellainen asia, johon voitaisiin kiinnittää huomiota. No, mennään eteenpäin. Ö, Mä olen digitaalisen kulttuurin tutkija, niin mä olen yhä enemmän alkanut kiinnostaa digitaalinen media, verkkomedia ja sosiaalinen media urheiluyhteydessä. Mä 2015 sit palasin naisten ja arvokisojen ääreen ja silloin tutkin MM-kisoja, miten, miten, miten ne näkyi sosiaalisessa mediassa tuolloin ja pyrittiinkö jotain yhdenvertaisuustasoa teemaa tuomaan esiin. Toiko joku taho sitä esiin, toivot urheilijat sitä itse esiin. No siellä oli monen moista. Mä tiedän, kuinka monella tämä on tuttu, tämä tämmöinen pieni episodi ennen kisoja, kun kisat hankaneus pelattiin, päätettiin pelata tekonurmella. Ja, ja tota, pelaajat otti siihen sitten kantaa omissa sosiaalisen median tileissä, että nyt se näyttää, kun pelataan turnaus tekonurmella. Että on periaatepäätös, että miesten pelit tullaan aina aikuisesti pelaamaan turmella, mutta näistä pelattiin tekonurmaa. Siihen sitten he teki tota, naispelaajat tällaisen Kantelun siitä ja yritti muuttaa tätä asiaa ennen kisoja, mutta se aika hyvin mediakin vaikeni sen, sen hiljaiseksi ja, ja FIFAlla ei ole mitään kiinnostusta niin kuin oikeastaan kommentoida sitä millään tapaa, että millä sitten luovuttiin, koska kansalliset lajiliitot myös painostuivat niitä lajien luomaan, luomaan siitä kanteesta. Eli kisat pelattiin siellä 50 asteisiin ja tekonurmalla siitä, kun keskusteltiin kisojen aikana, mutta mihinkään ei sieltä sinne tyneet. 
Sieltä löytyy näitä negatiivisia puolia, sitten myös FIFA, FIFA kielsi, kun Ruotsiin TV4 on sellainen periaatepäätös, että hei, kun naisten urheilusta ja miesten urheilusta, vaan urheilusta, kun ämmän pitää olla ämmän kisoissa. Mutta FIFA puuttui siihen ja sanoi Ruotsiin TV4, että tämä naisten ämmän kisoissa ohjelmassa ei saa lukea ja alkoi ämmän kisoissa, että siellä pitää lukea naisten ämmän kisoissa. Siitä ruotsalaiset toimittajat Twitterissä tai perusteli sitä, että miksi, miksi se on muutettu nyt näin. Uh, urheilijat itse, Norja maajoukkoja teki hauskan tämmöisen mukadokumentin uh, paikallisen TV-kanavan kanssa uh, vastaan kuin Suomen Yle. Eli he tota, otti käyttöön kaikki stereotypia just tänne, että kaikki naiset paljon on leskoja, uh, maalivahti ei osaa potkasta maalipotkua, hyökkäjä ei tiedä mikä on paitsi. Sitten tehty tämmöiset tilanteeksi haastattelija ja haastattelee ja nämä asiat tulee ikään kuin. He leikittivät näillä stereotypioilla ja ikään kuin käänsi sen huumorin keinoin, että et, et ironis onkin se, että kun haukutaan naisia tokalla huonoa tasoa tämmöisillä niin stereotyyppisillä käsityksillä. Se levisi on verran ennen kisoja. Sitten yksi mihin, mihin kiinnitin huomiota oli sitten taas tämä, että Englantihan pärjäsi poikkeuksellisen hy niin yllätyksellisen hyvin näissä kisoissa ja yksi miestä tai entinen Mies sieltä voi tähti tämmöinen David Beckham, jos olette joskus kuulleet, niin tota, hän kannusti tämän naisjoukkueen kisoja ajan. Hän viittaa siellä posta Instagramia, että et ihan mahtavaa ja upeita urheilijoita ja näin. Ja siinä on piilee mun mielestä semmoinen aika, aika kiva ajatus, että David Beckham on miljooni, miljooni, miljooni seuraajia. Kun hän nostaa sitä naisten jalkapalloarvostusta, niin tavallaan ehkä hänen seuraajansa myös alkaa ajattelemaan ainakin hetkellisesti sitä asiaa, että niin joo, että naisten jalkapallokin on oikea urheilu ja jalkapallo. Että tässä on tässä on tavallaan yksi mahdollisuus sosiaalisella medialla, miksei niin valtamedialla että jos niin miestähde ikään kuin lähtisi ajamaan myös sitä naisten asiaa, niin, niin sillä saattaisi olla ihan uudenlaiset vaikutukset. Toki siellä sitten esimerkiksi Englannin jalkapalloliitto taas, taas teki päinvastaisen vedon, twiittasi onnitteluviestin, että no niin, nyt ne sankarit sitten saivat, saivat mitallit, mutta voivat palata nyt sitten takaisin äideiksi ja tyttöystäviksi ja tyttäriksi sinne minne. Tämä herätti kyllä aika paljon keskustelua tämä Englannin jalkapallon viittikisojen jälkeen. Mutta laitas laitaan somessa uhkia, mahdollisuuksia sekä että uh, siitä, että ei se kiinnosta ketään sen ajalta. Tässä nyt muutamia lukuja, joita varmasti tiedätte. Kyllä puhutaan nyt siis näistä 2015 vuoden edellisistä MM-kisoista. Uh, Seitsemässä ottelussa siellä oli Kanadassa siis 50 000 katsoja, keskiarvokin 26 000. Finaaliottelu 25,4 miljoonaa TV-katsoja USA, Ranskassa 41 miljoonaa. Okei, Ranska oli mukana oman joukkueensa välierissä, se tietty vaikuttaa. Teollisuokana Fox omisti MM, se oli 200 tuntia lähetysaikaa. Suomessakin ne näkyi ihan hyvin, siis pystyi katsoa kaikki areenan puolelta, tuli, tuli ne mitkä ei tullut TV, TV-stä suoraan näin matsit. Mutta niistä puuttuu se kaikki hieno studiojuttu, mikä on miesten puolelta tuttua. Ei mitään ennakkoasetelmiä, ei mitään sellaista asiantuntijaa raatii siinä ympärillä näin. Eli silloin se on hirveän oman aktiivisuuden varassa, että naisalkoholoseuraajat kaivaa ne tiedot jostakin netistä, mistä ikinäkään, mutta sitä ei niin anneta, sitä ei pureskella ikään kuin valmiiksi ja luoda siitä sellaista sen tyyppistä urheilulähetystä, mihin on totuttu. Et se oli ne pelit ja selostettu ne kyllä oli. Mut, mut, tota, Siinä. Ö, Yhdysvalloissa kutsutaan jalkapallojoukkueet maajoukkueet naisten maajoukkueet ja miesten maajoukkueet, mikä, mikä se tietysti. tietysti ö, Yhdysvalloissa jalkapallo on ikään kuin ollut naisten laji aina, että se on suositumpaa naisten pelaaja. Mä näen, että tämä ero pitää tietysti, tietysti muistaa. Tuossa nyt ihan vaan mun mielestä hauska, kun näiden kisojen yhteydessä lanseerattiin ensimmäiset naispelaajat FIFA-konsolipeliin, eli mallinnettiin. Mä olen 2009 jo kirjoittanut asiasta, miten se voi olla mahdollista, että digitaalisiin peleihin jatkoon ei saa aina naishahmoa. Että sä voit valita korvalehtien koon ja pälvikaalin asteen, mutta sä et voi valita sukupuolta. <tos> mutta 2016 sinne tuli ensimmäiset naispelää. Toki tota, se oli Yhdysvallat, missä kan, niin kuin pelin kannessa oli nainen. Että on sitten taas vielä se, mitä myydään Pohjoismaissa ja Englannissa. Että täällä se nainen ei vielä pääse siihen pelin kanteen, vaikka sen peliin. Sitten mennään niihin mahdollisuuksiin vielä vähän tarkemmin. Tuossa nyt niin viimeisimpiä juttuja. Mä seurasin vuoden 2015 kokonaan kolme naisjoukkueurheilijaa. 
Yksi oli jääkiekkoilu ja Noora Räty sellaisen erityisesti, miten hän tuota, sukupuolta tuo esiin, esiin Instagram ja Twitter päivityksessään. Sitten mä seurasin tällaista rugbypelajan Persia Woodman maalitaustainen uusseelantilainen maailman parhaaksi Sevens Rugbyn pelaajaksi 2015 valittu nainen. Ja hän tuo erityistä etnisyyttä esiin päivityksistään. Hän on edustaa siis uusseelannista vähemmistöä maalit. Mutta tähän otin esimerkiksi nyt Nilla Fischerin, ruotsalainen jalkapalloilija ja pelaa Saksassa ammattilaisena. Hänellä on mun mielestä aika, aika tota edistyksinen tapa käyttää sosiaalista mediaa. Eli hän, hän tuo avoimesti arvomaailmansa esille siellä, vastustaa rasismia, puhuu yhdenvertaisuuden tasa-arvon puolesta. Ja se, miten hän tekee sen ikään kuin varmasti suunnitellusti, mutta jotenkin hienovaraisesti, on, siis hyvä esimerkki on tämä, että, että tässä on hänen vaimonsa näissä ja hän Kun pelaa Ruotsin maajoukkueessa ja Saksan liikajoukkueessa, niin paljon tuota matkustaa. Ja sitten usein matkoiltaan hän ikään kuin postaa Instagramiin, että ikävä sinua, kun tasin jää tämän tyyppisiä postauksia ja sitten kuvia. Hän osoittaa ne ikään kuin vaimolleen ne postaukset. Mutta se on julkinen Instagram, totta kai hän tietää, että sitä seuraa tuhannet ihmistä hänen tiliään. Eli ikään kuin rauttamalla yksityiselämään hän paljastaa niin kuin aika paljon siitä, että mikä on hänen oma arvomaailmansa. Ja tuota, tällaista näkisin mielellään paljon lisää. Eli tuota, se, se sosiaalinen median kana, kanava voida, voidaan urheilla, että voitaisiin henkilökohtaisen päätökseen, että se kanavoidaan tällaiseen. Mä ihmettelen, jos joku seura- tai lajiliitto jossain estää niin kuin tavallaan tämän tasa-arvo- ja yhdenvertaisuusteeman esille tuomisen. Tietysti voi olla jotain sponsoreihin liittyviä rajoituksia, tällaisia sopimuksia ja sosiaalisen median käyttöehtoja. Mutta mut tässä on yksi puoli, minkä näen niin erittäin arvokkaana sosiaalisesti. Sitten on yksi henkilö, jos nyt puhutaan näistä esikuvista, jonka, jonka tykkään nostaa esille. Ei, ei tule jalkapalloa eikä joukkoehdumaailmasta, mutta kaikille ehkä tuttu Serena Williams. Tuossa taustalla Nike mainos viime vuoden lopulta, jossa tuota, ää, on pudotettu female-sana pois tuosta. Greatest, greatest athlete ever. Ja Serena Williams on itse ajanut paljon tasa-arvoa sukupuoliasiaa ja tietysti etis, etis, etisen taustanakin kautta edustanut, edustanut tuolla maailmalla. Hän on haastatteluissa valtamediassakin todennut, kun hänet on kysytty, että miltä tuntuu olla maailman paras naispurheilija tai naisten ystävää, niin hän on sanonut, että I prefer just athlete. Eli jättäkää se female sieltä pois. Se ei ole mitään hänen itseriittoisuuttaan, itseriittoisuutta, vaan siellä on ihan selvä viesti takana. Uh, tällaisia urheilijaisikuvia nykypäivänä tarvitaan uh, yhä. Eli, eli siitä ei ole tultu siitä vuodesta 2009 tai edes uh, 1990 kauhean pitkälle loppujen lopuksi näissä valtamediaesityksissä. Uh, tässä on tota, vähän ehditti kuulukin olympialaisten aikaa, että millaista sisältöä silloin olisi vi viime kesäolympialaisten 2016. Niin niin Chicago Tribune twiittaa uh, mitallist, olympian mitallistista mainitsemalla, että hän on uh, jalkapallojoukkojen pelaajan vaimo. Ei mainitse edes nimeä. Uh, sitten täällä on Juoksijalehdestä. Tämä ei ole mikään yleisöpalaute, tämä on Juoksijalehden toimittajan kommentti. Urheilu on mukavaa katsottavaa. Piikkarimiehen sieltä kun loppuu kuitenkin hänen naisten hyrkkeilyä ja painia. Uhjutut kasvot ja veemäinen taistelutalto eivät sovi, sovi kauniimmalle sukupuolelle. Annetaan naisten olla naisia mikä on minusta jotenkin täysin kornia, kun olympialaisten ainoan mitallin Suomelle toi Mira Potvonen. Ja varma oli naurupiirro. Todennäköisesti, joo. Mutta siitä tämä toimittaja et, ei, ei sovi naisille. No tämä jättää oikeastaan tätä David Beckham-linjaa, eli Andy Murray, Murray tota, todella tunnettu siitä, että korjaa toimittajia. Häneltä on kysytty esimerkiksi olympialaisen, että miltä tuntuu olla ainoa tai ensimmäinen urheilija, joka saa yksi neljännen olympiakullan ja hän korjaa, että et, et olen ensimmäinen miesurheilija. Et Serena ja Evans Williams on jo valtavan miten Joo, sitten miten se Suomessa? Päätän tähän. <köhö> Ilta-Sanomat tuossa toissa viikolla ehkä piruili aamulehdelle, joka sitoutuu tähän neutraaliin linjaan, eli pyrkii kielenkäytössämme muuttamaan nämä 
tai poistamaan sukupuolen sieltä näkyvistä. Siellä on, että no, miten, miten sit kutsutaan naishiihtäjä tai miesvartiointia tulevaisuudessa. No, miten nois hiihtäjä ja pelaajavartiointi, aika yksinkertaisia juttuja, mutta mut, tota, tästähän niinku, nousi kova keskustelu tuossa hetki sitten. Yle on sitoutunut tähän Suomi 100 tasa kampanjaan mikä sen virallinen nimi on. Mä poimin sieltä tuollaisen, että yksi Ylen jatkuvaan parantamiseen tähtävistä toimenpiteistä on keväällä 2018 alkava kotimaisen palvelun mestaruusputki TV ja konsepti. Se nostaa naisten otteluiden tv näkyvillä samalle tasolle kuin miesten välissä. Eli nyt mä jään odottamaan, että et, 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 tässä mun pitäisi nähdä sitten ensi syksynä se naisten liikan päätöskielos finaalitteluun. Katsotaan kuinka käy. Yes. Kiitos paljon Riikalle. Siinä tuli paljon painavaa asiaa. Ja tuota, näistä aiheista kaikista päästään jatkamaan nyt meidän paneelissa. Eli kaikki nämä esitellyt henkilöt tässä saa tulla lavalle. Eli Riikka ja Aisselt, you are also welcome. Sinä täällä on ääntä Silja. Eli Then we also have Linda Ruutu, who is playing for Poiko Finland. And already made a small presentation of herself before, so you know a lot about the media, media parts. Also, you know, in the also in women's sports in general, but also from your own career as a footballer, know a lot about that. And uh, yeah, I think we're gonna have a lot to talk about in this panel. So we're going to talk about the challenges that we have in, now I'm going to say, women's football, because it's it's still like that in Finland and in many other places in the world. And I still know a lot about that and about the discrimination, what we have in football and also like Rika was talking about a lot of the, how media represents the football or the players in media. So there is a lot to talk about. I don't know how we are gonna do this in English or in Finnish, but maybe we can do both languages. And start with that. So, um, uh, if we start about the kind of a history thing here, if you think about how the women's football state has, has gone from, like, as we were talking about uh, the European Championship from 2005, as you show some pictures of Laura Östenberg Kalmari and compared to, to this year's European Championship. How do you see it? How, where, where are we and how has it gone, developed or how do you feel about that? I think we've developed in Finland and everywhere. I would maybe say that some other countries have developed faster than Finland has. So we have like many steps to take still. But I think that you can see kind of a turn towards like more professionalism in Finland compared to maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago. But at the same time, like, kind of like these big football countries in Europe, Spain and France and Holland and what Germany has been doing for longer, but you see the development there in women's football. Of course, they're bigger, kind of bigger football countries than Finland is. So maybe they have kind of taken bigger steps 
in the past five, ten years than than it has been able to. So I think it's a good direction, but still, still a long way to go and a lot of work to do. And I was thinking about has it um, changed as a sport? How how do you feel about that? Has it been like? Of course, it goes maybe forward and it's like many details, but how do you see it as a sport? I don't know, as a role the audience, uh, I'm wondering if uh, players are leaving earlier, younger from Finland, the other countries. For process most. I don't know if it's true, but I, I have wondered it. Okay, I'm fine. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll go down. But I mean, uh, <coughs> I was playing Finnish League in, I don't know, 2008 or 9 was the last year. So there were older players. We were over 25 years old in the league. And nowadays, they are really young girls there. So I don't know if that has some kind of influence. I don't know. From we have a national team, at least I didn't, and I'm quite in the bubble, in the football bubble, have been all my life. So I, I probably be the first one to know. And uh, so uh, I think the awareness has spread that that the young uh, boys and girls. And we should include always think about the boys as well, female footballers and the role models to boys as well. And I think the less we separate football, uh, is better. And I think that's the only only goal we have. Uh, as you mentioned, it, the the big deal of female football or women's football, they are they are the ones leading football as well. And, and uh, so um, I think uh, I hope that uh, when the the way I feel, see from the club, as I work with clubs and club development, when clubs develop their actions and, 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 and uh, they're doing, then I think it benefits the both sides. You have to have the togetherness. Yeah. As, the, as, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, that, that um, for my experience with working with clubs is that Less and less, I need to separately mention it. Uh, if they say, "Okay, we'll we'll hire a new coach for um, nine-year-old uh, junior," then I don't need to necessarily ask, "Oh, will it come? Will it be a coach in the uh, girls' side as well?" Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry for the language. Sorry for the language, but but then it goes to if they are developing their marketing, they normally think of both sides. They are natural thinking yeah. both sides. That is important. But there are still steps to go, yeah. I must be honest. Yeah. I think 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 so, so I'm not with that kind of, I'm from Africa, so I'm kind of different, you know. But now when you see most of these Finnish um, clubs, they are like more professional. So like she said as well, like, there's more professionalism in football now. Of course, like she said, that, like you cannot compare Germany, um, Spain, or even Sweden, that is Finnish country to Finland, like, you know. Uh, and I'm sure that in football, or in sport generally, you know, awareness and sponsorship really matters a lot because if the girls or the women team gets more um, support and um, courage, it doesn't say like half of what if the men have been given. I think women's ball will develop a lot because you can watch the European um, footballers in summertime. We were just one by the women. Football now has really gone massive and it's more entertaining now. It's not like 20 years ago when you don't know how to um, show some skills or you know, show some goals, but now it's really more challenging. So I think the women aspect of the FA and the country as well just need to give the female aspect more attention and also to empower more women in the industry so that you know like she said we, we are talking about the women football is not it's not even the most 
also, also we have some young younger boys and younger kids, and we've been a role model. We've as a woman doing a lot because when I was playing as a player, I had to coach now. And it's, it's for me, I feel so honored because sometimes when you train these kids, like last week I was in business professional school to play with this college and there are these young kids that just play football. So I went there and I had to go to play with them. It's like, hey, I don't think like, oh. <laughs> you know, that's why that's how like, you know, he's a kid anyway, so he felt like, oh, I'm about to play with my head. And I was like, oh, hey, I'm not going to say, 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 h
also, it's hard to say what is the reason. Oh, everything's linked together. It's a me. It's uh, and uh, so I think uh, also the awareness of being uh, little girls, they they know uh, they can watch on Ule, <laughs> the national team playing. And like on the 2005 European Championship, it was a big and successful yes. year for the Finnish national team. So those kind of things, it's yeah. of course important to have and have some more or more visibility from that and also in the media. And yeah, we were talking about the dropouts already, so now we know that we have the base. There are going to be many, many girls, but how can we keep them there? So, if I can add one thing yeah. that has bothered me all my life is yeah. that <laughs> when I was playing, I was always asked oh, when, when the season was over, and I, I didn't play at that high level, my highest was the first division. But anyway, I, I played and I, I played seriously, in my opinion, and, and it was a dear hobby to me. And I was always asked after the season, uh, oh, are you still playing? <laughs> and it's quite of a negative way of putting into words. Like, why, why can't we think that, that the person could play football all her life? Like, like I was wondering at that time, like, if I would play piano or if I would sing in a choir or would they always ask if I love something, doing something, if I love to do something, why would I ever quit? That's a good question. Uh, because yeah, I have to yeah, say. Yeah. Why they are asking is just if you said, that, for example, yet yeah, I'm still playing, this will bring to them such a motivation that will follow your step. That's it. Oh, oh my uncles and relatives. <laughs> 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 I wish, I wish, but I think it was more expecting me to, they didn't take it serious, they thought it was just a, you know, mood swing, that yeah. they didn't think that I would stick with that. And something similar to this is, I think, probably all like female top players have heard it at some point in their life, or what else do you do? Yes. It's, exactly. it's like, so hard for a lot of people to think that, you know, Women can just be an athlete. Yes. Yeah. There has to be something else, like this the assumption. And, and of course, it goes to your head also when people start to ask then every time. So mm -hmm. then you say, okay, I play football, but I, yes, I have done this and that. <laughs> but, but nowadays I have learned that I can only say football. And then, of course, some coaching and stuff that it's football and it's there. Thing I do, and I'm proud of that. And okay, I've done some other things, but no, I'm still 100% in the game. So I feel it's gone better, but it's I I understand because it's always like yeah, there are people who, who talk about that or ask. So that's I nice. think for me, yeah, what she said, like, you know, then of course she was probably she was quite young then, yeah. and then with the brothers or the siblings, like okay. Why do you still play football? And then, uh, according to what she just said, every group they have different experience, maybe taught and motivations. But for me, it was totally different and it was a bit kind of negative then, because how about just as one was playing in Africa, you know, they have this idea like, okay, if you have played football, it's playing football as a girl. And exactly when you are doing something that you love to do and really want to do, and there's kind of obstacles or conditions like, you can't do this because we're a And then when you are young, you know, you have different perspectives, you have different orientations because you are not like born as an adult, like 15 or 20 years, which you can do big decisions. But then you're like, you're maybe 15 or 17 years, and you still need to carry. And you know, African perspective and question is quite different. But then, if I wasn't chasing my dreams, I think for me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm being a great player today. And the reason is this because when I was playing then, you know, in my community, you know, like a lot of like kids. Because then I used to be like a boy. So all my friends, like, I don't even have a friend, like, I'm also like, with boys because it's like a little few of them, but then we play three. And then when you come out, I go back home and get some punishment. Like, okay, you go to play football, and then you go to play football, whatever I do. I'm like, I'll just try it. 
The next day I'm going back again. Even though I know after the day you really have the passion. But then it was kind of difficult for me, but it's because I love what I'm doing. And you know, when they talk this thing like you play football and somehow they see you playing football as a girl, then you're kind of bored. Or you're not serious, you don't want to go to school, just like okay, you just play football, you don't play anything. And I think now it has changed a lot of people, um, most people's perspective because the world is growing fast. Football is more or less a business now. A lot of great players there. And why I was really so happy because my story generally changed my community in Africa. You know, from Lagos, a very big city. Yeah. And then I remember when I played my first World Cup in 2002 in Canada. Because in my street, when I have to go and play or play football, when I have to you know, the club from, from different cities, I have to just sneak away and like, you know, hire a rest of the day. And I'm back home and get some money. And I have to go for you because I play football. Yeah. And then when I have my breakthrough, that was my first World Cup. In fact, when I was doing the one, listen to my dad because I know he's going to be mad at me. But my mother was kind of operating. Yeah. Said, okay, you can go, but don't tell him I have to go. You know, but then I have to go. And then when they saw me on the, you know, of course, the welcome was very good thing. They saw me on the media. Like, oh, and then it was in Canada. You know, fly from Nigeria to Canada is kind of like change of life, you know. <laughs> so when they saw me, ah, oh, then they were like, happy. And when I came back, home, you know, for the trip, guys, I just played really well on the video. You know? And when I came back, you know, the story was in the news. And, Funny enough, my the first story that wrote about me in Nigeria that I remember, the story was that the people that put your pictures like in the media, and the story was I sat was full up for playing football, now she's a star. So the mother was everywhere, and in my community, all the parents were happy, and then the people before I got home, a lot of people were in my mother home, like, oh, congratulations. So my story changed my community. So all the parents are saying, oh, you can go and play football. I said, I changed. What about if I was not yeah. kind of yeah, or something. Yeah. And I stop because I say you have to play for the boy. Yeah, because so there has to be so many, 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 the best thing is like so. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm happy now because many people are changing, football is growing, everybody's oriented, and life is changing really fast. And I'm so happy because now today football, especially, has grown really massive, both in Finland. Believe me, like 10 years ago, French league is not like this. When I play with Oiko, Onka, like when you play with them, it's like, because in the last thing, I think, I think there they have like five or ten national players from Onka or Oiko. Like when you're playing with them, they have like it was very challenging and competitive, but like I said, it's good to just hold on to your dreams and try to push hard as much as you can. Otherwise, you just drop what you love to do because people say, or your parents say, or your brother say, What are you supposed to play playing for? And then you get the kind of negative feeling. Oh, I don't want to play anymore because my brother said. And then it's instant. And we don't want to be able to do that. That is really inspiring. So, so thank you for that. Uh, something more around this? Uh, maybe the light shows different. Yes, I yeah. went to study and yeah. work and everything, yeah. and it goes. When, like, you know, yeah. some years you can do like three things together, but yeah. then it's not possible. Yeah, and we are different. Some some people can yeah. can study and play, and but then if you really, really want to be. Yeah, and I didn't get to date, so I yeah. had to work. Yeah, <coughs> but, like, like, so have it, yeah. So it's yeah, not having that. Yeah. 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 Somehow, like you say, you want to play like the high level, there's no way you can compare like balance. At the point, you have to do scale of preference. Mm -hmm. For one, for one, for me, I was having to be, at the point, I have to be my, my patient for study. Because I was in the national team, and you're in the national team, when you're in the national team, and you're not there, somebody else is there. And then, you don't have any guarantee that you're going back to the coaches, because they have different coaches. Good, bad, and ugly, that doesn't make for small reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I believe anything. They are different, crazy, or nice looking that maybe they don't like it for one reason or they like it for one reason. So if you just drop out and somebody else is there, then you might not have the opportunity to go back. So for me, at the point, I have to like perform my study for my career. But I'm happy because I made it through the career. Even though I dropped my school in the past. You understand? So whatever I've got today, whatever I've been today, even if I'm a football, football, football brought me to Finland in first week. So I play professional with football and I make good money. Whatever I've got today, because of football. So I'm always happy to encourage people who go to the younger one, the boy, the girl, the grass, whatever it is. I'm living, I'm living, I'm telling from experience, not because somebody told me, because it happened to me, 
Now, we don't want the same to offer the young girls from the young. So, let us see how it works. You can choose. Yes. You have to have the possibility to choose. Yes. Yes, yes, like uh, I said, uh, said um, from a multicultural perspective, in uh, Central Finland uh, in particular, um, our association has really tried to play a very good role in integrating immigrants, as especially women, into, into sport. Because um, as we all know, um, some of uh, the immigrants come from background where, like, in Africa, up to today, uh, sports is seen as a, a, a men's, you know, thing. Cycling is seen as a men's thing. Women drive by car, while the men have to cycle. We have this gender, gender role. So, but um, through our association uh, with the sport of uh, Mona Liku and the sport of Likuka, we've had women um, cycling, you know, uh, Working on the gym, trying to swim. I'm talking of African women, not yeah, cultural women. Women from the Middle East, like Iran, as we know women from the Middle East. I mean, Middle Eastern countries, Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria. They don't have to do certain kinds of things because the culture doesn't allow them to do that. And so, uh, through this, I mean, our associations, they've been like, you know, doing um, uh, all of this. And um, this has really been uh, due to the support that we receive from you know projects uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do so because the projects actually pay like for the balls for the gym and so on where they have to practice where they have to play okay if it comes to maybe cycling the bicycles are rented by Simon Aliku for them to do so yeah, yeah. yes yes so once these things are available like uh, we are going to have the stadium in Lekalampi uh, on Saturday where uh, the competition is going to take place and with the sport of Mona Liku, the women are going to have the gym and where they are going to play. Everybody can really come together to, to do some kind of uh, uh, sporting activities. And you know, there is this kind of, there is this change of attitude, as uh, Isaac just yeah, said. It's that, that, ex yeah. Exactly, as Isaac just said that yeah. when, because I mean, we've, been, we've grown up or they've grown up in some kind of cultural, you know, box, once women see other women, you know, like playing football and, you know, swimming and cycling, then there is a kind of cultural, you know, breakthrough. And so more women come in now to, to do the same kind of activities, not only playing football, but in other different kinds of sports. Because before we had the support from Mona Liku in our sporting activities, many of the immigrant women were just sitting at home. If they didn't have work, they were just sitting at home. Yeah, or they go to the shop, buy food, yeah. and then come back home and they sit at home. But so sport brought, brought them yeah. out, yeah. everybody out, to do something, to yeah. see other women exercising, and then yeah. the others encourage to exercise, yeah. and then telling their friends that, please, come and exercise. And that yeah. actually creates a community, yeah. a situation here in Finland, where some people, especially immigrants, they are not isolated, but they are part of the general population to do sports for the health of everybody. Yes, thank you. We can maybe continue from this to the part about the diversity in the football. So is there enough possibilities for the people who, who have come here from other countries, immigrants? So how do you feel about that? Can we can we really like uh, give the same possibilities to the people moving here. Do you have experiences with that? Um, well, we should, and um, <laughs> now we could. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's difficult to see uh, now um, the barriers which exist. I mean, it's as for me. Uh, as a white person in Finland, it's uh, what do I know? But it, people need to tell the like. You need to tell the barriers. You need to tell where those exist in the structure. And uh, and uh, I would think we need to your passion. <laughs> I would take that passion, and then uh, then the responsibility. Christian mentioned it on, uh, before that um, that. Uh, 
But then again, there's, it's not easy balance that uh, we have now, for example, in football in Helsinki area, uh, for 10 years' time, we have teams who are um, majority, majority are uh, foreigners, uh, which is which is fine and, and it's their choice, but then they don't. Then there are like original Finnish teams, and they they don't uh, mix. <laughs> So that's one thing as well as, as I said uh, of female football and uh, of men's football that we the less we make go separate ways the the better and it's the same I think with foreigners that if they just uh, join in the local team uh, they will learn the language it's not easy and that's the, that's the balance. Should they go with the, with the foreigners, with their, uh, the ones they have the cultural link or and the language? And so I think it's always individual uh, choice and, and, and hopefully they have a choice. I think um, if you say like when you talk about integration, I should say that, that women they should. Not that it's not possible, but it's possible because of course, there are some foreign players now playing in the French League, maybe the female aspect of the year league, but it's really not enough because the FA needs to do a lot of work. Like, you know, when you compare football, they say, of course, Germans, football players, we all know about that, and they put a lot of um, resources to their to the football and stuff like that. And um, Finland, too, uh, like you said, that the language is difficult. Of course, I wouldn't say we should see that as a barrier because, like, when I'm to Finland, then, so.
is called because uh, wounds, and especially for football. Uh, and this kind of uh, place because uh, another the reason, the one reason is of course that there's stress because they are the situation is very hard and, mm -hmm. and uh, people can be depressed and so on. Yeah, so it's too much. Yes, yes, yeah. it's easier to just stay here to normal. Normal uh, place and so on. And uh, I think the other, other problem is that there is no culture. So that like you said that, for example, in Iraq, they can't play football or that kind of things. And uh, easier to tell husband might say that, no, you can't go or that kind of things. It's much easier to get them, for example, to go to get a cook something or a certain mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. But those women we have got to do parts of the ball. Mm -hmm. And uh, other sports, they are not. Mm -hmm. They have been so happy and so, so full of energy after this. And so, so, I think it's so, so nice to hear that they, it's maybe at first really hard, but still, they, if you encourage them enough, so yeah. then. Yeah, but I'm putting it it's easy. It's easy to say that, you know, say, try, I can come and here, then you go to pick up the one spot. Yeah. 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 It's part of the things that I was saying in my opening, but I didn't say exactly what I meant. And of course, it's uh, frustrating to me when Isaac now says uh, the Palolito must do something. Why is it frustrating to me? Because we have done this work since 20 years. And we have worked with the Palolito 20 years before. And the Palolito has stopped working with anybody. And now, please don't take this as a criticism. Take this as a watchdog trying to help football. We are a football family trying to make football better for everyone. It's not, you know, an attack. It's just how it is. But if you know how much we have worked with football. We know we have started a, a program to make uh, migrant uh, referees. And now we have a lot of them, and it's helping you a lot. Suddenly, the Football Federation decided. Yes, I think so. It helps you in yeah, the generation yes. that we now have a lot of immigrant referees. Uh, uh, the Federation has stopped working with uh, the organizations and with the grassroots and with the experts. And that's why then you're sitting 15 years later and you're still wondering about the same things that we already had done 15 years ago. We're losing a lot of time. And uh, <clears throat> the, the other thing you were saying about barriers, and there's, we said, the language barrier, and there's a lot of barriers, cultural barrier. There's also one barrier that the Football Federation has introduced 2009, 2008, 2009. When you complain about racism, you can be punished as bad as if you have done something racist. So you have, or to understand, it's already a barrier for a person to go out and say, oh, I have suffered, I'm a victim. Uh, I'm different than the others, I have experienced racism. But then if you also say that you will punish this, instead of saying that, good, if a person talks about racism, maybe the person is misunderstood, maybe the person is wrong, but it's a chance to talk about it. You shouldn't punish it. That's the thing. And then about uh, mixed teams, non mixed teams. We had a lot more of those teams. Now, sorry, I have to talk about the men's teams, but we also had women teams. Uh, in the, um, you, I think you have not been there already, but in the um, mid and end 90s. We had, in Helsinki, we had over 30 immigrant teams. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think what we have to say here is that uh, together when possible and separate when necessary. And um, these teams have all disappeared there. You say now there's more and more, but there are not even as many as in the 90s when we had, in all of Finland, 20,000 immigrants, and now there's 300,000. So we should have 10 times more teams and not only half as many as we used to have. Because this is a good starting point. Like we, Monali, we work at Monali, who is doing the women, yes, it's separated, they're separated, but it's a starting point. They can pay, because you said we don't know, but Monali knows. I mean, they know where is the barriers, where is the sensitivities, uh, you know. And the other thing you have to remember is like, many of you are professional footballers, I have been. You know when the machine is running. Trainings, games, 
somebody comes to the country from the outside, maybe has never trained, maybe hasn't trained the last two years, has trained in a different level or in a different kind of context, and you can't just jump in. You can't just jump in. So to have those kind of teams uh, on clubs, it's easier to start. It's easier to start. And I've been coaching and running those kind of teams, and also for women. And the sad thing for me, in a way, but also the happiest thing was that every year the best ones were leaving us. The captains, the, uh, uh, the, the coaches, the, the ones who took care of the medicine bag, always the best ones were leaving us. Because they were learning, and when they were ready, they went to the mainstream. That sounds good. Really. So we need both. That's, sorry, I have one point I wanted to make. So thank you. I think <laughs> A quick question. No, I want to uh, say something. Uh, yeah. uh, I want to say that um, since living here in Finland for nearly 14 years, I've lived most of my time in the hospital, and uh, I understand the problems and life of immigrants here in Finland very well as an immigrant myself. And uh, if, you, if you come to Finland as an immigrant and you live in Helsinki, only in Helsinki, you will hardly understand immigrant problems and immigration very well here in Finland. You need to live in Uvascular, in some kind of remote places for you to really understand. And also I've been working a lot with multicultural associations and I have a lot of experience in this. This is what I have to say. Sports in general is one of the best area areas to integrate immigrants. Because in sports, people just come and play together. You don't need any permit also to, to, to come in. It's not like in a party where you have to have an invitation before you come. You can always Sports brings people play. together, everybody, and it helps in changing the way people look at, especially racism and people from and people from other countries where people are playing together. But what, what I have noticed is that, like you were saying, you come from the um, federation, uh, is that most of the funding projects and so on are limited within this LCK Usima area. The people at the grassroots right down the way the immigrants are who are supposed to benefit for Finland, for example, to become a kind of homogeneous country where everybody is living together peacefully. They are not reached people uh, down there. So my uh, proposal and suggestion is that more support should be given to grassroots organizations in Finland to promote especially sports because we've been talking about there are many talents in Finland in the area of football for women and in other, and in other areas which are hidden. People don't know about them. To, for those talents to come out for people to know about them, the projects that exist, especially here in this Ushima area, should reach out to these people by what means? by making most of the stadiums like free for, for the immigrants, providing you know sporting equipment, paying for, for training, paying for coaches and so on. Like in the case of our association, Kesky Solomon Africa it is to, uh, the African Association of Central Finland, we've been existing since 2004, but we've never ever had any funding. Say 1,000 euros of funding, never. We have this uh, is it Augustus, this uh, Grants from the Vascular City Council, which is just 500 euros, 500 euros per year. And if we don't get support from, say, Lituka or Mona Liku, there is, there is absolutely nothing we can do. Because if we tell our women and the men that you should pay 10 euros for us to have that stadium, they would not pay. But if we say, okay, Lituka has paid for that stadium, they, they, they have paid for the balls and everything, come and practice, they will come and practice for free. And, because the reason is that most of them they are not working, they are unemployed, they want to play, they want to be part of the society, they don't have the means, they need the support. And so it is from this reason that I said that I've said that grassroots organizations should be given more support. For example, in Uvascular, there is this thing called Footies Uvascular, promoting sports for, for women. So <laughs> this is very quickly, important. If I quickly reply, yeah. um, is that the, uh, the uh, Mm. Oh, okay. Financial support 
that that's uh, everybody. That's everybody who wants. That's everybody. All the club, uh, top players, would like to have better salary. Uh, all the projects, uh, stadiums. Uh, everybody wants to have. And we have. I'm not making excuses, believe me. But I'm just saying that we have a limited amount of money. And then there's um, and and I, I I agree. It's based on the decision making. Is that you need to value what should we support the like now a few days a few uh, years we have um, supported um, I don't remember how many maybe eight national team players that they have a small amount uh, of money monthly yeah, uh, so that they can focus yes yeah. so that they can nice focus thing. better on football yeah. and that's a choice we're making yeah. and we have made. So, so um, um, I agree that the, it's uh, uh, but the way I see it, that the amount of the pie we are cutting is is rather small, but we should uh, um, make more people aware of all the goodness football makes, uh, local and for the community, and and not just playing football, but also one for volunteers, uh, childcare. Uh, schools and and then we get more financial we get more financial support uh, from new um, from new uh, um, sources and uh, uh, from new uh, firms or politicians might think that oh this is they not necessarily support football but we can make make them see what kind of effect it has on people's individual health and, and life in general. Then, so we need to make that small pie we're not voting for. Everybody wants their piece of the money. So we need to we need to keep that pie <laughs> and then we need to have more so that we can think of uh, should we uh, uh, give money on for the grassroots for clubs to do their school events promoting events or the top players or top player, female top players or should should the uh, men's national team go on a camp uh, to Qatar for example for a week it's yeah and it's the decision making that uh, that I get your frustration but we need to get um, uh, people who are making decisions that they Support this what we are talking about here today. Yeah. Okay, I, okay, I have just one example that goes yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because in Norway, you know, little town, <laughs> you have lived like I don't know two years. Uh, we have this um, club called Musan Salama, and I have been watching there. Uh, there's a team, or should I say, community for refugees. Uh, mainly a male player, and um, they are playing together, and they have female coach. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of challenging uh, at first, but but now when they have get used to it, they know that in Finland female can be a coach, and, and you, 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 if the coach is to take the goal and put it there, and they are doing it now. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but in the beginning, but, but the yeah. point is that I think it was. Opetus ja kulttuuriministeriö. Yeah, they, they had this project funding money that you can have, and also there are another organization that you can uh, have money, but you, you have to know how to get it. So you have to have someone who knows where to get project money. And then we have this. There's a guest push, I don't know, in English, in, 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 in Bori, uh, place for refugees and immigrants, and they are doing this in cooperation with the uh, sport club, football club. So I think it's working quite well, but I don't know where it's going to lead. We have to see it has been like a couple of months ago. I think I know. Yeah. But there are some opportunities, you know, where it's working. It's not on this what link to this subject is that what I'm concerned is that we are now 2017 talking about how to get women into football uh, as players or 
or then uh, some um, decision makers. But uh, I think we should now we should now have uh, fifty fifty percent of female at every level, and we should now be talking about in football how we get young people, how we get uh, ethnic people, how we get disabled people. So it seems that it takes. I hope I'm still alive <laughs> when, when, when we're. <laughs> I no, I, I can't be like uh, sure. cynical. cynical. Uh, no, I. We need to be optimistic. That's the only only thing we have. And and then we need to be the ones who make difference. Yes. And we are here. We female panel are here making difference. But but uh, yeah. So uh, so that's that's. That's why I'm worried that we we are so focused on on this female thing, and it, and it can take a few years maybe still, and and then uh, then we have other things, other minorities as well. So yeah, now we're talking about a lot of women, women working in football, and so maybe a conclusion about this is that we don't have you know women working in the top level uh, yeah, positions and in clubs on a higher position. And so, yeah, and maybe we, streets, but I'm yeah, I, I take responsibility yeah. for my organization, but I also, uh, it's uh, half, half of it, it's the clubs, because they make the decisions of the, who they represent and, and so on. Yeah. So I hope they, they choose people who will carry your or our agenda forward. So also I think the issue is not like if you said when they're making the decision of the decision maker, the issues. I think choose the right people in the right position. Because sometimes when you choose the wrong people in the right position, it just things are not gonna work with the way you plan. Yeah. And of course uh, you know when you talk about this uh, decision maker, it's not of course it's very important to have to empower a woman empowerment to make decisions and decide whether or not you have to do this. But also it's important to have some, for example, coaches or if you go to the coaching courses or other things, other, other stuff because football now, like you have to have different aspects and different roles in the club or the team. But when you are there, the most important thing is, um, you can only look about the work of now. Like when, sorry, I'll have to go back to watch the video which is showed when you get a presentation about the work of in Canada, in Canada in 2015. Remember? That's what really, I felt really bad and really really hard work because in, in, the, in the world of football, there's no way, I'm sure there's no way, I've played in three or four uh, FIFA World Cup, there's no way FIFA will allow the male team, even if there's maybe there's some problem, that depends on the actual stuff like that. There's no way FIFA will allow the male team to play most of the two times. This World Cup is a less of grass. Because it's supposed to be fun, you cannot protect grass. I, I know how it feels <laughs> as a, a, a goalkeeper, it's, it's really tough. Yeah, so it, yeah, it, is, it can be okay, of course, but still, if you compare that, it's men and women should have both the same. Yeah, of course, we know that they get more money fine, that's yeah. what talking about that, but when you talk about the care and the, also the care yeah. welfare is very important here, because all those things are important because of the care and the care and the care and the care and the care. So, in the national team or club side and grassroots, it's more important to have more females as well in other aspects. Because like, I'm coaching on some team now, and maybe there's their age is 16 to 18 years old, more teenagers. And somehow, you know, when you have a female coach, somehow it's different from what you have, like, really, like all the teams, like, male, 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 and there's no, no female. Because somehow, all these people have some problem, like, with less administration, or they have some discussion. They are very free to talk to me. Even they have their own children, they know. They feel like, okay, please talk to me, like, 20 years old. Of my life, okay. right. So all my life is And then they are free to talk to me like, okay, this is my brother, 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 one thing I've decided to, and I, I am doing, is that uh, when my colleagues are uh, planning the uh, agenda for the seminar, and they were giving the keynotes, presentations, 
I go through and I said, you don't have any women on the list. <laughs> they, don't, they don't even pay attention to it, but now they have started. And, uh, and then I help them to find one because they don't find, they, they don't, and I have quite a good network. So, so I'm, I'm maybe saying that, okay, maybe we have a very lot of good come to, to that uh, event as a, as a top, top player or a, a, as a role model because they, they tend to think first all their friends, all their network, all the all, all, all the, uh, their next teammates, uh, how it goes. But uh, we, need to, we need to help our colleagues and we need to point out that they, like all their panel and, and, and then ask why is it and if they say there's no specialist on this uh, subject, yeah. then, it, then it's fine, I think. Yeah. Then it's so fine, because we don't want to be here course, just if as you there needs to be one woman. No, no. Yeah. We want to be here. I want to be here as a specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a professional. Who knows about and, it, and it doesn't matter if you're a Exactly. Um, yeah, but that's exactly the main point that the central organization is still so like one minded that they don't even see women. Yes. We don't exist. And that's yeah, very that's sad. To, that's yeah. very sad to hear, but I can recognize that very well. I started to play when I was nine years old, and of course, there has been some years I haven't played. For example, when I lived abroad from Finland, but that's what I still see. Uh, so, uh, still, some years ago, I don't see it, maybe it's five or ten years ago, uh, I joined to the football family again, and in that kind of uh, um, hobby team, yeah. yeah. So, and I started to receive that um, a new, uh, like a. Putaya, yeah. Putaya, uh, newspaper. It's a magazine. Magazine again, and when I I had checked like five uh, magazines, and the situation was still the same. When there was an interview, they were interviewing, for example, you. Mm -hmm. There was your pic, your pictures, mm -hmm. but all the pictures or photographs that was was in the magazine were always men. When you have to pre re represent football, it was a man. And yes, and the, the women are always an exception. Then I want to give you um, one example, a very practical one. Well, I have been like a referee for since last summer or last autumn, and just now in May, I was a referee in in games for boys nine years old i was paid 30 euros 29 cents per game yes. and when i was a referee for nine years old girls i was paid 11 cents 69 euros why on earth please Check this kind of. I'll check it. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you don't know. But I just want to give it like a practical. Well, exactly example. the same. Exactly uh, the same. Same field. Same, same time. Same time. Same level. Same level. Same level. Okay. So please, that's what you need. What, what we need. We and have need to, to be careful that it doesn't mean that they don't change it. That is less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We need to be careful yeah. on this bringing up yeah. the subject, like. Yeah. Oh, you want less? No, you want the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So this is what I want to tell yeah. that yeah. we have to important. open our yes. eyes and start to recognize where do we have this distinction and and yeah. well discrimination very clearly. Okay. Yeah. Something. And um, what, what you said, I think small difference, small small things need to be done, like this one or the fact why is the national team not playing on the Olympic Stadium when it was not in Vermont? Why were they playing somewhere else with the men? I mean, there are small differences that really, really are very important. Then you say that women are minority, right? That's somehow I understood from what you said, but you said there are 32,000 
girls and women playing, right? So I think it's quite a big number that now they should be noticed at different levels. And I consider that not only it has the role to tell the parts that they should change their mentality. It's, it's, it, if, if you don't do it, then nobody will. Considering about the media, I was at some point talking to somebody from Ula that they, uh, they said that why the women are not shown that much women's work with it is because women are not telling them, they are not sending them information about when things are happening. Again, the, I think the blame is put somewhere else as it should be. So I think this thing should be discussed all the time. And I, I don't think it's a I think we still need to discuss about women in football, in sports, in Finland all the time. And it doesn't have to exclude ethnicity and other stuff. I think we should discuss all these things all the time. And it doesn't take from the focus on other things. Yes, I think because the time flies, so we can continue from your. Uh, thank you for your. Um, Yes. <laughs> thank you. So we can uh, continue to the media part because that is very important. So yeah, we have gone through, or you have told us a little bit about that. But but now focus on the football in media and especially maybe in, in Finland now when we, when we start. I spoke already. I'm glad you. Yeah, we're about Linus research. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, my my research was from Esari, as you said, I'm not the main newspaper in Finland that was about women's football, but about it's interesting representations know, about like, female athletes yeah. in the media. And partially, I did it kind of quantitatively, seeing how much or how many headlines there are about women compared to men. And but then the main focus was on how they are represented and what things are brought up in the headlines and kind of my main question was what kind of information do they present about female athletes and what what shows when female athletes are mentioned in the headlines and still like like how in your presentation you said about about somebody example about the super mama like unfortunately we still see kind of those types of organizations still like unfortunately often and my my material was from last year's fall and there were quite a lot of examples about mentioning motherhood or that they're a wife or something completely unrelated to sports and even in situations where the athlete had done something like really successful, like they have done really well in a competition or something, but still sometimes the focus was on, on on looks or family or something else than, than the sport. So kind of those types of representations create information that suggests that women aren't athletes first, that they're always something else for it, that they're mothers or their wives or their object of like something not not related sports to sports related, so, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. So kind of the idea that and like media has a huge influence in affecting people's opinions and what how they think of the world. So if Hesari shows a headline about a female athlete saying that, you know, her main thing in the year is that she got married. Versus then a man who, you know, won a, no, a normal sports headline that they won a tournament or something. That creates quite a different information about what the female athlete is versus what the male athlete is. And then if we think about football, so how do you see that? Or maybe maybe you don't see anything <laughs> in media or in the papers. So one Saturday, what about that? The last yeah. big round with, yeah. and, uh, uh, which was really exciting when you had beforehand. Uh, yeah. So, like, so much on the all the medals, yeah. Like, so you couldn't see it on the yeah. housing it's and all that. I you just have to know it <laughs> because if in the morning, if you read the Saturday morning paper, there, there was something else on the exciting finish. Or, if you think about the yeah the 
gold medal and the silver and the bronze was everything was open and like a really big games coming and there is is it anything so, i think it was yeah i mean it was there was a, it was Potential. on a plate yeah, yeah it was really giving on the journalist on a plate that it was it would have, it was a good thing. stuff to write about because yeah. it was so exciting and mm -hmm. and 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 so I think it's a shame. It's such a shame. It's frustrating, mm -hmm. and it's a shame that they don't they don't use it. The explanation is no one cares, but they could care if you. I can think keep there was a yeah. yeah. people. Yeah. Hundred yeah. thousand people yeah. watched what cared when they saw it on the telly. Yeah. 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 So they do care, but they, yeah. they explain it that first demand then offer. I think you should basic and that. Yeah, that's all the explanation you have to because it's not because <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not if men or women play, it's about the uh, excitement or the how, how, it, or how would you say that it's like. Uh, yeah, in the football, how how exciting mm -hmm. it can be if, when it's like that when, when you play those important games. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you uh, discussed about that uh, people are they are going to upload. Yeah. And again, and so on. Yeah. So this is to uh, nineteen minutes magazine, which is uh on the week on Yeah, the magazine. Was it the uh, uh, newest one? Newest one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they have article about this. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. It's only for boys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. using yeah. the uh, yeah. young service yeah. players yeah. everywhere. Yeah. There is no any mention about it. It's only for yeah. boys. Just yeah. when you are looking to names. Yeah. How many? How yeah. much uh, space? Space. So you have here. Yeah. So many. Yeah. 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 So are are yes. Yeah. You want to add something for that? Yeah. 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 Men are struggling, struggling the same. Yeah, that, that I'm not, I'm not commenting on this because yeah. it's not my yeah. place. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I hope you can help. As I, I, I wish a club member yeah. would be here. I really do. Yeah. Or a media person, but a club member. Yeah. Uh, to, to uh, that they would ask now when we have our. Uh, Board meetings and uh, annual meetings that they would ask, is this the message we want to send? Yes. Um, I, I'm quite alone at the office yeah. on this subject, yeah. and so I, I, I really uh, ask for all the support yeah. I get. Yeah, and it relates to the whole issue of women's football or nice yoga bottle. Mm -hmm. The norm is still considered to be that it's, if you say only football. Most people think men's football, and then you have to separate it. If, if you talk about women's football, and like it shows here yeah, too, yeah, that like, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's the as these are like the things that like, in but the language, academy. Yeah. But the language matters a lot. And yeah. like, if in this kind of a thing, you write both, you write yeah. both about girls who are there and boys, and then you kind of create that knowledge that football is not just men's, or mm -hmm. that you don't have to mention women's football to talk about football players who are sort of... You know, but the attitudes are quite hard. When I'm telling these things, they say, yeah, but you're feminist, and you are already <laughs> you know, and stuff like that, but quite often, so it's kind of scary. Yeah. I'm not to telling it, but I notice if I put in the feelings, if you. I say how it feels, if I say this is wrong, they might be yeah, maybe lack of time, lack of money, lack of interest. And if I say like this really hurts my heart, that this this is this is like this affects my feelings, then I see 
that there, there leaves it some kind of reaction that oh that's it and okay I do yeah I think we should put, explain more how does like okay this is just a fact mm -hmm. and then explain or ask how does it make you feel how, how does it make you feel as a player or as a employee or as a whoever and then then try to explain and then I think when people any person gives their feeling gives you the feelings or tells them that you start to think or at least anything to be really hard <laughs> person, yeah, person. and I don't, I don't really that yeah. on my on the people on on the other people in the I, I I don't consider them. I just need a bit of help and mm -hmm. and uh, so that they don't see it. Yeah, they're in their bubble as well, yeah. and uh, they are a bit intimidated and afraid. And for <coughs> for example, if you're a 60 years old uh, man. Uh, it has the world, world has changed, and and then for their generation, there are quite new things to adjust, and uh, and then we just need to keep up the dialogue. And, and, uh, yeah, continue from that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and what about the um, sort of idols like the quote idols, women. How can we help with that? How about that? Or we don't but not see too well, many. Well, maybe just uh, if we are just yeah. happy of the, yeah. the small steps, yeah. like uh, Marianne Mietinen you know, yeah. has uh, uh, proven that how big influence TV has. Yeah. That we know in our, our uh, um, but within a small group, we need. We knew she's a professional and she's she's uh, super inspiring, uh, inspiring and 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 person in general. She's really really. Uh, she has been a commentator in the men's games yeah. and also, of course, in the yeah. women's European Championship. Has done it very well in both. Yeah, just football in general. Yeah, fun because the real yeah. sense where like she was too professional. Yeah, right. Yeah, the yeah. 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 Who knew that there is going to be a, a championship and there isn't anything around the game? You can see the players. There are not so many uh, interviews, only in the half time or so. So, how do you feel about that? Or do you have something to add to that and the idols? Yeah, like if you compare, like. Especially, it's interesting now after Ulemi that kind of promise to be more equal in their like what they offer, but then when you compare their kind of what they did for the men's Euros in 2016 versus now the women's Euros in 2017, it's exactly that that there's nothing else besides the game. And okay, it's good they're trying the games, but then when you like compare before the men's tournament, there was like months of kind of building the hype and introducing the players and talking about the teams and how this team plays and how this team plays and what to watch from here and what to point out from here. That creates a lot of more excitement and interest towards the tournament versus when you have nothing before and only the games and then it's like a lot harder for someone who isn't already in the kind of women's football world to get interested in that because it's when you just see the game and don't really hear any like points of interest from the studio or pre programs or whatever, then it's a it's not that them. easy yeah. to come into the into the game if you don't know the players because you could do a lot by small things. Yeah. <coughs> not that much. You don't need that much, but still 
and it's how you said too about the, the last round of the league. It's like such a shame that we lose these opportunities because it is there are chances to bring up the players and kind of create those role models, but when they're kind of made invisible by the lack of any material about them, then it's harder to or young yeah, children. I want to say children and not girls yeah. because they can be role models for everyone. It's harder to see them as role models when you there's not much stuff on the yeah. So, and it's good that we have uh, social media, of course, but that it's not enough. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, and it's not like it's the clubs club. so it's possible. Yeah, and maybe the players there. like, what, what do I put there? And, but it's not, not enough. At least there's it's, something. Yeah, yeah, it's easier for, for to, to find those role models and still. It's not enough when you don't see it in the papers or in the media or TV. Yeah, there's also a lot of um, social media where you can show yeah. it. So it's what you feel that you feel about the song. But it's to say that most of them don't know. So then it, you don't even know why you look for the name. And like, if you really want to grow up, you see the picture and you write it, oh, it's a room of the other So you can give a lot of motivation to the young dress kids and all that. And sometimes you do something um, for the future and to keep memory alive. Like, And it's uh, it's really vital, but really important uh, also on the aspect of uh, the finance because uh, I uh, that um, the then on a national league level playing women's uh, teams. They uh, um, the problem is that they don't uh, income. They don't bring income. So it's really for the club. It's really a heavy responsibility to get, for example, eighty thousand euros to cover the season, and and uh, uh, they want they want to have for them. It's also in important on other uh, perspective to have women's like they want to have equal equal teams that they have men's team and women's team for them it's important in other ways but uh, then when it comes to uh, when we need to count the money then it's difficult but they it's not necessarily if they choose okay we, we are not going to have a women's team uh, next season on, on this level it's not necessarily a, a discrimination or it's sometimes based on the money it's and they can't and as i talk that. with them and they are like yeah but but they can't sell sponsor they can't sell any um visibility so it's hard to sell get sponsored to for a team that you can see the, the research cycle going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, exactly so what you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's, it's not easy. <laughs> we should be able to make it make a stop on that and where everyone is trying to do their job. It's and, a small part. Yeah, it's a mean. small part and do <coughs> so well we can. And like there is so it would be so much uh, to talk about, but the time goes so fast, <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe we have to close it like this now, but we, as we said, we have so much potential in women's football in Finland, as around the world, so yeah, we are on the right direction, but <laughs> still a lot of work to do, and yeah. This was really, really nice to be able to talk about these things and yeah, a step forward maybe also. So thank you so much 
for the panelists and people coming here. Thank you. Thank I'm <laughs> 
I think my masters and PhD in the vascular. Uh, I sociologist. So, uh, I, I used to, we used to have our faculty there at Matlanyemi. The MAA building where you have the Lina restaurant. Behind, we then we moved to Indus Mines here. And then, uh, this. So the duty of the is the master's so I am Well, I am defending my PhD this spring, and uh, then uh, I have applied for a postdoc. I thought you already have your PhD. No, I am defending it. It is done. Okay. It is finished, okay. but uh, the defense is in the spring. Okay, well, that's good. I used to play tennis. They would tennis in the league, in the league, uh, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. along the corridor. Yeah, before you go to. <laughs> So have your book been very positive in the eyes of the revenue union? Has it been very positive? Thank you. 
and I never explained what to this. No. Uh, yeah, well, of course, it wasn't like only this. We had an association of the team who was there, but anyways, like, it was like uh, my soccer experiences. But today, uh, I am not here to say more stories about me. I am here to talk about another traveling issue, which is discrimination experienced by sexual and gender minorities in sport. And I am giving this presentation also on behalf of Maria Kakonen, who really wanted to be here, but she has teaching to do in the University of Nebraska. So I will be the one presenting. Uh, Maria, besides that she's like, uh, one of the people that supervised my PhD, like uh, with her we have been working together in a anti-discrimination sport project funded by Erasmus Plus, a European project. Uh, the name uh, was Iris, it just finished last year, and during this project one of our <coughs> Of the things that we try to do is like to raise awareness on issues of discrimination experienced by gender and sexual minorities in sport. And uh, Maria has also been like uh, researching this topic since 2011, I think, and she has given me permission to share some of, of her results. So basically, what I'm going to be doing. Today, I am going to talk to kick some briefly, very briefly, like uh, some international uh, research findings from homophobia and heteronormativity in sport, what do we know, how they are manifested in sport, and what are the consequences, the effects of this. And um, I'm going to share, as I said, some of the findings from Maria's study. And I am going to also briefly share with you some of our future research projects on these future plans for research in this topic, and maybe some of the educational material that we developed during the, the Iris project that I previously mentioned. In this presentation, I am using the term gender and sexual minorities to refer to all those people that do not feel that they fit to the traditional gender and sexuality norms. And when I say traditional gender and sexuality norms, I mean the beliefs, this belief that uh, there are distinct genders, and these are only two. <laughs> the male gender and the female gender, and the only natural sexual orientation is heterosexuality. This is like a, we refer, this is what we call heteronormativity, and within this, within this, we believe there are like, a, they come like a negative attitudes often, and prejudice for people that do not really fit, do not feel that they fit in these norms. And we have talked a lot today about the uh, all the positive uh, things that sport can do for our uh, mental and physical health, for integrating people from different cultures, all the like the positive things of sport. But uh, I also love sport. <laughs> I don't want to ruin this picture, but uh, actually research also shows that uh, sport is one of the most conservative places in the society. And uh, problems like sexism, racism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, uh, like extreme nationalism, like uh, many problems are manifested in sport more than, more than in other things. So yes, like I also believe that sport has the potential to bring people together and make us all feel better, like for like, uh, like physically and mentally, but also there are problems within the sport that, uh, yeah, this is why we have this conversation today. And, um, uh, yeah, like homophobia and heteronormativity are 
uh, really resilient in sport and research shows uh, that they are reproduced in uh, various ways through the language that we use, through the practices that we participate in, or through the identities that we ourselves maybe perform or that we um, value more or other identities that we the ones that we kind of the ones that remain silent or they are like uh, marginalized and uh, I think I have some examples you know Maria's collections is like collective clippings uh, newspaper clippings from like uh, incidents of discrimination and how are these kind of reported by the media and this is like about the language that is like commonly used in sport like common language <laughs> and uh, the interesting thing here I think is how the athletes are trying to justify this language that this is something that comes you know natural when you are in this kind of emotional situation of elite sport and people that don't belong to this elite sports culture and they don't know this pressure like they shouldn't be judging this this is like part of this the emotions and the pressure. <coughs> this is like an interesting uh, justification for using this kind of uh, language. And this is like uh, similar that this language, like it is like uh, so everyday behavior in sport, it shouldn't be even punished, or it is like. Uh, like, uh, okay, if you say to the referee, but uh, we are calling our opponents for teammates for the time. Like this, or like, uh, it's not like a, a punishable behavior. These are interesting justifications from the athletes themselves that they consider this kind of language as part of their culture. And they don't even think that this is something maybe negative or something that should be punished. But uh, this language is not uh, innocent at all, even if it is just a joke that was not meant to harm anyone. Like it creates a hostile and unsafe environment in sport, as, as it has been reported in research by people belonging to gender and sexual minorities. Uh, they, report that they often avoid organized sports for these reasons avoid altogether, like uh, research shows that uh, this is like especially in team, team sports. Or when they choose to participate in organized sport, uh, they might choose to keep some aspects of their identity or for themselves like uh, silent or hidden, and avoid to be open in sports. And this has consequences for both mental and physical health, like both have consequences to choose not to do sports, like leading to a more sedentary life, or to live a life kind of having so much to keep yourself hidden. And uh, research shows that uh, people belonging to gender and sexual minorities report like uh, feelings of fear, anxiety, and isolation, and many other problems. This is just a summary. There are like really like um, shocking papers talking about uh, suicidal thoughts and uh, yeah, very detrimental consequences. And uh, discrimination is also <coughs> structural, like the rules, the categories, the facilities that we are using in the sport are meant like our built are created with this binary logic that people in this planet they are either like men or women so still like it's an issue that it is not like often addressed like how we include other people like to the sports the sports that have like gender segregated categories for example and bathrooms and uh, locker rooms and so on Uh, unfortunately, in Finland, this issue has not really been investigated. This is like a 
to be quite shocking. And uh, I think that the, the study uh, conducted by Maria in 2011, which was published in the report was published in Finnish in 2012 and in English in 2014. But this is like basically the only study that we have from Finland. And I think it was like now people have come to, I didn't, like now we have come to realize it because I think it was like a recent European report that they were writing about this issue and they were calling all the countries to give the data that they have and then suddenly like people in Finland realize that there are no data in Finland. There are no, no data. And uh, discrimination of gender and sexual minorities has been investigated in Finland in other fields, like in work and school context. And they have been found like high levels of discrimination, especially in children and youth. But the sports scientists really haven't paid in Finland. I am one of those. We haven't really paid like the proper attention to this. To this issue so far. And as I said, I have permission from Maria to share some of her results. Her study uh, focused on discrimination of gender and sexual minorities in the context of sports, exercise, and physical education in school. And she wanted to also study the effects of the discrimination has on well being and on the engagement in sports. It was an online survey questionnaire that was like sent like between 2011, like 419 people uh, belonging to a gender or sexual minority like answer this participated in this study. Uh, two thirds approximately of them were like recreational athletes and one third of them were competing athletes. And uh, here are some of the, they were also open and open-ended questions where they could write about their experiences. And uh, since I am more into a more qualitative, I don't really understand the numbers very well, so I <laughs> chose a quote. Uh, I am more a qualitative researcher. So um, this was like uh, we have the belief that they are, the belief that the, their skills or the sport choice is somehow associated to the sexual orientation. This was one of the common issues uh, that uh, people belonging to a gender or sexual minority had to deal with. For example, like this quote, you are damn good at boxing, of course, because you are a lesbian. This belief that these are somehow connected. Or my colleagues think that I go to public swimming pools only to see other naked men. To be honest, I only go there for exercise. These are like the common beliefs. Somehow they devalue the efforts of the athlete. The efforts that the athlete has done to be able to perform that well are not really rooted to the sexual orientation. Another common issue the gay jokes <laughs> or like uh, this kind of uh, uh, comments that we often say that are not really directed to a person, they are not meant to harm, are part of the everyday language, the culture, and sport. And we have like a, like a woman here saying that uh, the nasty, nastiest discrimination experiences have been the gay jokes or other dismissive comments from gays which have not been directed to me but have been just everyday joking. I talked earlier about structural discrimination, gender-based changing rooms and bathroom facilities that are excluding people, like for example, trans people. And here is like a, a quote from a non-op trans woman, changing rooms and other comparable facilities. Completely exposed are a problem. I don't accept going to the men's changing room just because of my genitals, 
and they wouldn't use any special changing rooms. Being a woman, I would like to use women's changing facilities, but I know that I cannot expose my body in public anywhere. This has greatly limited my engagement in sports. So far, I have changed the toilet, but it doesn't feel like a sustainable long term solution. This is a problem that it is not often addressed. Like, uh, also, the categories that we have in sports, in many sports are somehow including the like, many people. And now we go to the last year's polls. Like, uh, there were like reports about the discriminatory behavior by teammates and also coaches, and PE teachers. So really troubling quotes. For example, this one from a 19-year-old teenage global player. He says, a few guys from the team gather around the TV in the place we were staying. When I joined them, they started joking to each other, and after a while, somebody said, so how is our fagot? Enjoy your effing little boys. Don't you fucking ever come to the shower with us again. They didn't stay long because they decided they don't want to spend their time with a fuck. From that incident onwards, I have often heard similar comments by the same three, five guys. They avoid me and behave in a bizarre way, even in matches. As if I weren't there at all. I haven't felt like telling my coach about it, as he also keeps telling gay jokes. The atmosphere is particularly awkward in the changing room after the training. <clears throat> These are really like troubling quotes. And from the PE context, like um, when we talk about coaches and PE teachers themselves being the agents of discrimination. Um, and 29 years old man said that uh, our upper secondary school PE teacher said homosexuals are pedophiles acting against all natural laws, like to cop a in the shower and make sexual propositions. He pointed a finger towards one boy, a year younger than me, who was the only openly gay student in our school. He did a lot, and I constantly heard rumors about his acts. As a result of this, my coming out was delayed by at least five years. This is like to, to, to kids in the school. Like this is this is harassment. This is harassment. And uh, there are even experiences of sexual harassment. They were like within this sample, there were like five participants that reported that they had like a, a coach had suggested sexual intercourse to them. So these are really, really troubling results. And uh, <coughs> in another like uh, another publication. In a more restricted, Maria took a more restricted sample of these 419 people that participated in the study. It is the 155 that they reported that they had experiences of discrimination within the past year. So she analyzed this smaller sample more carefully, and it was found that all different types of discrimination, as she has handled in categories here, uh, questioning the sport skills and uh, all the all the types of discrimination are related to mental ill being. They have like uh, detrimental consequences for the mental health. So here we have a question. It's a question. These people are doing sports on. Uh, that's the word I am also using my English. In the, if doing sports for these people, it is like actually bad for their mental health, while we are, have been talking here all about the benefits of sport. And there were also some group comparisons within this, like a group of uh, this sample of 100. 55 
participants who had experienced discrimination, and there were like some significant differences, the one with the bold letters and some just trends, the ones with the non-bold. Um, for example, a significant difference was uh, individual sports, uh, statistically significantly more frequent experience of being feared or avoided, and their sexuality being questioned and more frequent psychosomatic sexual than in team sports. This is somehow contradicts the international literature because international literature shows that team sports are actually more, maybe more homophobic, but uh, Maria study from the Finnish context says the opposite, that it is the individual sports. And there was a trend that athletes in individual sports were more depressed than athletes in team sports. And the significant difference again, female athletes, individual sports have been uh, more frequently feared or avoided than females in team sports. The trend in male athletes, individual athletes were more depressed and had their sexuality question more frequently than males in team sports. Yeah, this is somehow the different than what the international literature says on this topic. So the, yeah, the picture is not really right, and uh, there is a, definitely a need for more projects to investigate these issues. We need to learn more uh, we need to, in order to be able to understand how this, how homophobia, transphobia, all these like uh, troubling beliefs are re reproduced in our sport stakeholders. So we need to understand this in order to be able to tackle them. It is not only, we need to have this, this knowledge, because it's the same thing with the women's studies. We are making these efforts and all these campaigns, but still these issues, we find them like, and we are wondering why it's, we are discussing so many years of these issues. There are like complex mechanisms that these beliefs, these stereotypes are reproduced in our sport cultures. And we need to understand how this is happening in order to find ways to tackle it. And uh, with this in mind, we have just like uh, submitted an application to, like, uh, for a research project to investigate this issue further. Uh, the, and here, like, uh, our is a list of the organization that have committed that they will uh, collaborate with us in this future project if we get the funding. We don't know yet, I think the decision comes in March. And people representing in some of these organizations are here today, so we thank you for, uh, for this support. Yeah, this study is meant to be like a three-year study. It has like a qualitative part, and qualitative part. It has like uh, to collect data from both physical education, the context of physical education, but also from sport. Maria is the PI. There will be like uh, many people working on that, and uh, it goes through it will be my postdoc. And uh, even though we don't have secure funding yet. Like, uh, we are, uh, I don't know if it is that we are very optimistic that we will get it or that we are very... Uh, there is a need to investigate this issue, so we are kind of willing to do it anyway, I think. And we have already collected a few interviews. They haven't been analyzed yet. Like, this is from interviews that I collected, just like a quote again. Uh, pointing out the, how small things like uh, gay jobs, for example, might matter, like create hostile environments. And uh, I spoke about the Iris project earlier. Uh, I would really like to encourage you to visit uh, this uh, web page. Here is Port uh, during this project. It wasn't only us, it was like uh, uh, 
uh, five different European uh, institutions, some were universities, some were like sport associations. We tried to develop educational material for coaches and uh, PE teachers on how to recognize incidents. It's not how to recognize incidents of discrimination because sometimes it happens and no one even sees it. How to recognize them and uh, how to deal with them and maybe how to create more inclusive environments so we have less incidents like this. And uh, we developed two, there were like six kind of educational model, modules, if you go to this web page. We created the two, two of those, the rest they were like from other European partners. And one of the modules that we created, it was like the focus was on uh, uh, gender and sexual minorities and the issues of discrimination that they have to deal with. And there was also like a, a handbook that it was our task to write. And you can download it from these uh, uh, the web pages. Uh, it is in English and in Finnish and in some other languages. It's in, in play, the whole platform is in five languages. And uh, this is a very nice book. Rita has also written a, <laughs> it's a very nice book. one. <laughs> So it is like uh, there are there aren't that many resources about the uh, issues of gender and sexuality in sport in Finland, and this is one of the few resources where you can read uh, more about that. I have a list of references that you cannot even see, but I can if you are like interested in reading more on that topic, I can share these slides. Yes. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. And, uh, this was really an important study that we saw here, and as you said, many positive things like football and sports, but there is this other side too. And now we're going to talk about that. And it's a panel about homophobia and discrimination in football and in other sports. So Anna will be one of our panelists, and then we have Erika Patrikainen. Welcome, and we also have Linda Lotto. Will be here again. Welcome. Thanks. And Maybe we can start start with Erika, 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 who is um, working for the OOTRU. So you can maybe tell a little bit about yourself and then about OOT that is that has a birthday year. How do you say that? About twenty twenty years you have already been. Here, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the sports club hot. It's mm -hmm. the only uh, LGBTIQ sports club in Finland at the moment. So it's a little bit untypical situation because in uh, Europe generally there are many like small clubs all over the country, but in Finland we only have clubs, and we have activities in Helsinki and then in. From there, there we only have one global uh, team. In the Helsinki, we have, I think, about 10 different sports and something like 13 different sports groups. So we have the gender based groups in some sports as well. And yeah, the uh, club started as um, a group of guys. They played volleyball together, they were friends. And then they were wondering where to get uh, more practice spaces, so they started a uh, hot in order to get space from the city to play volleyball. And yeah, that was 20 years ago. And uh, I've been in hot since 2005, and I think I joined the board in 2006, so I've been there. Quite a while already, 
And I think ever since 2006, we've had the more than 10 sports every year. So, and we have like 200 to 300 members. It varies a little bit, a bit but something like that. And um, besides our activities in Finland, we uh, take part in international LGBT tournaments. There are quite many. If you start looking like every weekend somewhere over Europe, there's nothing happening. So, and next summer there will be a huge event in uh, Paris. It's Gay Games, that's an organization in the US. They're organizing worldwide event. So I think there will be about 10,000 participants there. So it's, it's going to be huge, but over 30 sports. That's what we're looking forward to. That sounds, sounds really good, so thank you for coming. <coughs> uh, if we start with, um, with the challenges that, that there can be with the LGBTIQ people in sports. So how do you feel about that if we go directly as, as Anna Anna was talking about here in the study? So there. There can be challenges. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it's the same like before. It is difficult to spot if you don't really like a. If you like a. These are. I don't like the categories. I don't yeah. really. I don't like you know, I don't feel very comfortable with these categories. But uh, let's say that we are using them just to be able to communicate. Better, and so I don't really feel comfortable with that. But uh, there are different issues faced by different people belong to identify to a different group, and uh, in a different sport or in a different context, there are di different issues, and uh, we cannot easily put them in a box. <laughs> yeah, that these are the LGBTIQ issues. There are not they might differ a lot. Mm, yes, mm -hmm. uh, they might differ between like uh, between yeah. they might differ between groups, I think, but also between different sports or between mm -hmm. different contexts or between different cultures, between the different mm -hmm. ages. For example, research like uh, like what the research shows that uh, there are like attitudes start becoming more positive towards like gay or lesbian like female athletes, but still like uh, there is. Uh, May gay athletes, there is lots of fear, anxiety, it's more difficult to, to be open about uh, sexuality. There is really, like, internationally, there is like almost nothing written about this, like, a handful of studies on uh, trans people in sport. Yeah, I understand, because it's, it's like, I don't understand why there is it, but I understand <coughs> that it's, it's yeah. so different. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for me, at least, it is difficult to, to say what are the issues faced yeah. by, for example, trans people. Yeah. yeah, once I try to go to a, a kind of gender conference space, it was like people from the trans community, like uh, giving. Like uh, two people there, one was giving a talk at the end of the conference. I tried to approach them and to say that uh, I am working in the study of discrimination <coughs> sport, and uh, I was wondering if you want to discuss with me, like from your perspectives, what are the challenges like uh, for you yeah. in, in sport? I understand that you have all their bigger yeah. problems, but uh, like for us, it would be kind of we would like to understand. And there was like a, a woman, she looked like a character of the Almodovar movies, and she told me, Sport? What are you talking about? We are afraid to go to the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> so we are here. Yeah, I don't know if I can talk about all uh, the challenges. Yeah, because it's a really, really big thing. And it's like. Uh, yeah, now when we're talking about football, so maybe if we have something, something about football in particular, you don't really know know about that. But 
talking about openness and kind of if you think yeah being an athlete and as you were talking about before how how can you be like um, uh, what is the meaning for the athlete of being able to be open open with everything with the sexuality and like that. Yeah, of course, like I said too, like it affects like your health <coughs> and, you. mm -hmm. and like and like I can say that I've been quite like lucky I've ever felt that I I couldn't be open to something the teams that I've been in, but of course that's only one one like example and in a woman's team maybe it is easier than in I think the kind of stereotype is harder there. The kind of attitudes are more negative towards gay male athletes than towards lesbian athletes. So it's a different dynamic there too. Yeah, if you're a guy, uh, you know, the media might be interested in you, but if you're a woman, as we <laughs> say, no one's going to write about you, so it doesn't really matter to tell me. See, there are many campaigns going on about um, uh, racism and, and, and uh, respect, like uh, trying to put homophobia down. So that is also important. Of course, yeah. Yeah, there was this. I, it might have been a couple years ago now, but I think in uh, in hockey, some like video campaign, like. 
I think it was called something like I'm gay, but I can play. And it's like, okay, on one hand, great, but on the other hand, like, why are we still talking about this? Like, is that even, like, is that an issue that if someone is gay, that's what, like, it, that it's not connected how like mm -hmm. you said to it, it has nothing to do with it. So it's like sad that we still need those campaigns that like mm -hmm. someone still thinks that because a man is gay that all or something like ridiculous like that. So mm -hmm. I want to say something yeah. about these campaigns. It's yeah. the same thing that it is with a like, women's campaigns. I have seen this campaign. Com I don't know if, if anyone here has worked on this campaign. A princess, soccer princess. Mm. Yes, like uh, I, I, I don't like the la like for me like the words matter, the language matters, and uh, also in martial arts like my club is using like like uh, tutto paini for the other woman. It sounds like a joke. Like, or like uh, when we started having our women's only classes to bring more women to the club, they put a pink logo. Yes. And then everybody comment. So like uh, there are there is there are these campaigns that they have people behind that have like they really want to make the change. But uh, these campaigns are not usually uh, based on research because we don't have like this much research. But we don't have actually the knowledge of how to check to how to create this change. We don't have this knowledge. And we just like uh, we don't even like study the research of these campaigns often. Yeah, I, I think also that we adults are somehow we are coming we are coming quite too many steps behind children because, for example, thinking about that princess campaign, uh, you can hear children to say or girls to say. Who wants to be a princess when you can be a president? Because they are already aiming so much more what we adults can't even yeah. imagine. And then it's, it means that if we don't uh, hurry up now, we are, we, are, we, we, will, we are already and we will be more like barriers for children to go ahead. Because they are, so many times they are really ready uh, because they, they start to see it already in their childhood in very different way what we have been educating and what we have seen at school where there isn't there wasn't anything like that we couldn't even name things what did this the, this time are all normal for children I, I want to be very positive in that yeah, way because children they are open with everything so mm -hmm. it's they don't like have problems in our yeah on the yeah. other hand that's that's one excuse that you know, like i've heard uh, some sports club that they just want to wait and wait for the next generation yeah. everything will be better but no, that's no. not I mean, if, if you have a coach, they have so much influence on the kids. And I heard about the French uh, study, I think it was in football, and uh, they measured their um, players' attitudes. It was guys, probably something like over 10 years old, and they were more homophobic because of their how the atmosphere in the sports clubs was. Mm -hmm. So, because, you know, the individual people, if they're on top of the yeah, organization they affect how well, the future will. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I think we should rather actively change things than not just wait. I mean, no, I don't need <laughs> to, to wait. We yes. have to act yes. because in, we have to act in the field of sports also because the world around is changing a lot. Yeah. If we don't act, we will we will stay. Far more and more steps uh, behind. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I, uh, there's so many things we should change. Mm -hmm. But one example was mentioned the jokes. I think m more and more people should uh, defend the one uh, who's being joked at. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference. Uh, mm -hmm. if, that, uh, uh, Nothing changes if we are just 
uh, commenting when it is just talk about us. But then I think the responsibility is to to uh, put zero tolerance on the jokes that uh, are not. Uh, well, uh, yeah, are attended, yeah. and and uh, and then uh, I think that's the coach has uh, and uh, the captain of the team of the coach. I think the adult is the first one to be responsible, and uh, and I think it's dreadful if if the person is the one making the jokes. I think. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, it, should, it should be uh, really discussed if, if the person is uh, able to work in the lab or yeah. work in the team. If they can do yeah. yeah. if something yeah. like that happens, then, yeah, but kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think there's been like a couple pretty like nice examples of cases where like someone from like a club leader or coach, I don't remember the exact instances, but said something like pretty homophobic on Twitter or something. And then they were like fired immediately after that. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see that that's, it is less tolerated now than maybe some years ago. But of course, like we want to get to a place where it's no one feels okay making those kind of jokes. Yeah, exactly. You don't see them on Twitter. You're disappointed <laughs> that they even write that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, yeah. In, it's in everyday life. Maybe coaching or players, so then it's harder. Harder to see. Yes, I, I don't want to claim any sport, but then we have this thing called ice hockey. Mm -hmm. and ice hockey, <laughs> and then uh, there's always people like Johnny Tangen who says there's no K player in female in ice hockey, or there is this. As a mega who says that they don't have to take part in any eco conference or anything. So, mm -hmm. and, and the ice hockey is the sport in Finland, so I think that affects yeah. so everything. It's you know, really uh, nice yeah. to see the yeah, 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 really yeah, 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 hard. yeah, I hope they're it's changing, but it's their campaign. yeah, 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 it is really nice to see see that someone has to be the first to yeah. yeah. and I think it's not easy yeah. in my life so to be the first team of the other team. Yeah, yeah. I hope a little so. bit. A little bit there was some, <laughs> yeah. some yeah. before the some next get generation. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just have a one comment. I was yeah. a week ago in a equality clinic by only because and there was about 15 uh, uh, operations present. Uh, and, uh, and also on top of the ROS Association. And one of the suggestions that deals with what's cultural and is working with, with this campaign now in the players union, if you know the people. Uh, but I didn't say you, but I, I, I reckon I, I'll have a talk with him later when I'm with him. Again, uh, that uh, she was, he was talking about uh, gender, uh, gender as a well, minorities and this work that she's doing. But then she uh, spoke in referring himself that uh, as a norm, norm <laughs> I, I don't understand yes. this, this, uh, all the other um, terms and, and things like that. And it was like, oh my god, you're working <laughs> yeah. together and you don't understand this. And you use that kind of phrase and it's, yeah. then it's, and there was all this funny little personnel there and she, she was trying to educate them, but it's, we still have a lot of work to educate, uh, like, association, but also mental health. Yeah. And, and who, who work with that, so. Even doing doing campaigns, so uh, it's, it's really really important. And um, <coughs> so, what can we do? What kind of actions can we do? Or if you think about in the clubs, or in, what should we do besides the campaigns and the 
and stuff. How, how can we educate people then? Or to be, yeah. Or like, yeah. Well, I don't know how much of people talk about values in, in, uh, like within the team or something, but it would be a good idea to go through the teams and the club's values. Like maybe every season to remind them that we're open to everything, like for everybody, and no one is to be harassed or bullied in any way. And maybe share some positive examples, like about people coming out in team and what happened, and you don't have to be afraid. And you know, um, yeah, because normally like the negative examples come up in the headlines, but would you? And then maybe also some sort of like education for coaches and other adults that work with, especially with kids and young people, because they're at such an impressionable age that, like I said earlier, that what the coach says like matters a lot to how how people learn about these things. So I don't know if it would like maybe it's. A little optimistic because, like, as it maybe has come up, but like, it's quite conservative about certain things. But like, if if like these kind of like federations could take a stand, a strong stand, and kind of trying to create a culture where maybe it was mandatory for youth coaches to take a course and like sensitivity training or something like that, and it could also include like more than just like this. Like gender and sexual minorities, also like issues with ethnicity and like all sorts of kind of yeah. like, everything to do with like inclusiveness. Realistic that is, but like something where it wouldn't be possible for someone to be a youth coach who's like completely ignorant about these topics. And there aren't these courses available in Kima. I am I work in Lipunda, the only sports university in Finland. The students that are like starting to become a PE teacher there, they are like educated in gender segregated classes. Like in, in many topics, they are separately. The like uh, boys from the girls and men from the women, based on the belief that based <coughs> on stereotypes that women cannot do as well as men in there. So like these kind of. Like really conservative, stereotypical beliefs that, uh, like uh, we have been talking today, they are like really deeply rooted in the structures of the sport system, not only in Finland but everywhere. And now we are talking about educating kind of how volunteers, coaches, not even the people that are getting like the highest degree are getting this education. There is no educational material. Yes. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, it's, we are always lacking uh, volunteer persons to, to work in the, with the teams, and that's what we would need more, of course. And even better if we could choose a bit, not to accept everyone who wants, but, but to check a bit uh, the person's uh, mentality. But uh, as you said, more, a lot of education is needed to, to make people to, to realize these kind of things. And the other issue is to, in the, since from the, every sports federation, make a, like a code of conduct, the things you are allowed to do and things you are not allowed to do, never, never ever. And this kind of thing should be included there as, and, and even when you are going through the, an education and you have to read that code of conduct and sign it, it at, at least it, well, of course, there are people that, oh, yeah, you have some kind of, oh, okay, okay, I will write down. But to, to make it a bit more serious, that you have to read the paper and with your signature to tell that I am I agree with this kind of code of contact. This is quite normal already in the uh, organizations that are working with human rights or uh, we 
children's rights? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned it for values and the and are they mentioned it in the sport language. Uh, they are more and more often uh, when I work with clubs and uh, and um, uh, Uh, we start by thinking what are the values of the club, if they are thinking of marketing or, or, or uh, coaching principles or, or strategy. And I think that's, that's very important. And then, then uh, uh, but I think it, what I hear is not that people, and I understand that they want the of course, the, the biggest association to take responsibility and be the leadership and, and show the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, well, I think um, also work nowadays is kind of upside down. Mm -hmm. That it's also the club, it can be like they pay us, that because we are a big conservative association. Uh, at the moment, that uh, that the association actually needs to see uh, things happen. In things happen. The club start yeah. to yeah. their values. Yeah. They yeah. they show that this is the way we are going. And if the association is going the other way, then why? But uh, so I I think it's a bit upside down now. I, and I, I think it's fine. But the, I think we always come a bit behind. But the world changes, and then you know what I, what we try to do is that the clubs keep up with the change. That they 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 start their own social media. They start to think how they talk about their uh, uh, girls or 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 um, how they would sign the agreement with the coaches. How how they represent their club. Mm -hmm. And it not doesn't but necessarily comes from the it's harder. Uh, yeah, that. and then it's more uh, the, the better the closer it is to grassroots to the, the action action level, then it's uh, people commit better if they feel that it's their own agreement that they have been uh, able to influence kind of have an impact on what are my club's values. Then that somebody says that this is this is how it should be. Should do both. Yeah. So yeah. Both, uh, the values are more and more important, and uh, and uh, the sponsors are asking for those. And I think the, the time is to take responsibility at every level. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We we have to start from each end because if we start only here. The way is very long to go, but if we and if we start from the down from the grassroots, equally we have so much to walk. But when we start from broad levels, some someday we will meet. And I've heard so many times uh, people saying at the association uh, that no, they don't want that. They don't want us to take part. They don't want us to say anything. And the problem is also that the values nowadays in Finland are they're getting mixed with politics. Political. Yeah. Political. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, uh, not everything what is uh, part of society is always like politics. It's like human rights, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, in in the language and in the context, they're becoming. Well, like politica. And then, then because of the fear of uh, uh, taking part in politics, like I, like uh, I don't see Paolo uh, say being supporting some, for example, be that Erdogan or opposed mm -hmm. or so that's the that's the that they we get mixed what is politics. And what it's the value of uh, values of our association and our like globally of uh, football values, like the fair game and respect and equality and so on. To see the difference. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you have something to? Uh, <coughs> oh, 
Yeah. 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 Um, one, one example yeah. also about the data uh, yeah. also in, in volleyball, uh, was it last year or this year in Wakata, the first of only the game, female athlete in Finland in team sports. But he, he wasn't a Finnish player, he was a Canadian player, but he played in Rovania and in Wakata and the team supported, so that was quite interesting to see that. The team team went behind him and then they even participated a bit a bit uh, right hand. And that's something that we need more for yeah, of those yeah. Yeah. Uh, examples. Yeah. Yeah. And real support behind that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that we should keep in mind that the person can be open within within the group. And not necessarily completely, not necessarily in media, but uh, I think that it takes a lot to the uh, that they still have a right to not be in the paper, paper, and make a big issue about it because yeah. it's not being in the closet. If you you're like, yeah, my teammates know, my workmates know, my family knows. And we're still talking about, yeah, but you're not open about it. If you yeah, 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 yeah. you know, may, need to make a big issue about it when you're interviewed. Or whatever what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think even the issue of <coughs> coming out is kind of problematic yeah. because, like, it's kind of like, unless you come out, you're assumed to be straight. So that's like already a really unequal kind of starting position that people who aren't straight have to come out like mm -hmm. of course that's an issue of like all society not just sports but kind of like why do we have a society where you have to prove it or like some something like you know what yeah, I'm saying I like understand why it has mm -hmm. to be like that the that assumption shouldn't be that everyone is straight yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. and then you have to say it if you're not yeah. rather just we're all people and then yeah. if you want to share how you identify that you can but yeah. that there shouldn't be any pressure to do um, do we still have time, <laughs> or yeah. is it? Is it yeah, I was oh. thinking about um, if we talk a little bit about hate speech and like uh, in the sports events, is there yeah still still homophobic like? Shouting or like, yeah, we have been talking about a little bit about that, but that you have to maybe fear of getting getting that kind of hate speech when you play or or whatever. Is that that is a can be a big issue too? How do you see that? Do we have some? Yeah, yeah. like I. I've never felt like unsafe or anything while moving yeah. or something. Like you do maybe more in like men's games. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not so actively going to any other sports, so I don't. I can't yeah. really comment on that. But you do hear like homo little in men's games or like mm -hmm. using the word gay as a slur or like if the referee does something bad, like or something like that. Like mm -hmm. you still hear it, like. Maybe not often, but every now and then, and it's every time it's too much. Language, I think. Yeah. 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 It's a bad thing that uh, even the fans are, are yelling something from the audience and stuff like that. So, yeah, like the yeah, <coughs> one campaign, discrimination free zone, is, is a good thing. I think so, that those kind of campaigns 
argued to make it more like open in that way because it seems that we need that because it, it doesn't come like that so it should be like that but, but still i think for me i think we need the, the campaigns to make it more bring more awareness i don't know how do you feel about those kind of Campaigns. Yeah, I, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean that we shouldn't have campaigns. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I just wanted to say yeah. that uh, yeah. we need more knowledge to what yeah. they're saying in order to yeah. have better campaigns. Of course, yeah. we need to have it. Of course, we just wait. We should yeah. do whatever yeah. we have. Yeah, but, uh, and, yeah, so, yeah. yeah but uh, I don't know, for me, it is like, of course, unfortunately, there is still, like, we see this, like, troubling comments and uh, for me, I think the more tricky is not the things that are said with this hate speech and uh, the things that are written and said and so but sometimes even the things that are not said, the things that are silent, the things that are not allowed to be expressed. Like, uh, it was before, like, we discussed a bit about, like, being out in the public or only in the team. Well, I think that uh, what people people do in their like uh, bedroom is no business for anyone, like for them to be discussed in the media. It's yeah. not like the media's yeah. business, yeah. like uh, when they are talking about the police, why they need to come no, out again. No, yeah, so I think this is like uh, for everyone. But uh, then <laughs> there is like this issue that even though it is, no one's like, um, uh, is to, to be discussed, but still we need role models, there needs to be, like, uh, uh, these things need to come into discourse, they need to be, we need to be able to, to discuss, that there shouldn't be this assumption that we, you are, even if you don't, if it, that everybody is just heterosexual, if you don't just kind of state in the media otherwise. So there are still these kind of assumptions, and in order to be somehow challenged, people need to start discussing about other sexualities, I think. So it is kind of a tricky, yeah. tricky question, I think. Yes. But uh, for me, it is more problematic the things that are not said, mm -hmm. that people do not dare to say. Mm -hmm. More because we say obvious. something, there is a kind of like a negative comment, and then people can deal with that. So there are people we see people are getting punished now, and then they are getting fired. Mm -hmm. and we find ways to deal with that. Yeah. So that are not said. Are coming up like that. Okay. The, the things yeah. that are not said, how do we deal with that? <coughs> At least my experience uh, in sports, the silence is the worst thing. Yes. Yeah, in Helsinki, or everyone is openly gay, or and my a sport is floorball. You're assuming a lesbian who's played, so <laughs> <laughs> no one assumes you're straight. Um, yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I played it elsewhere as well, and there it hasn't been the case. Of course, it's, just, it's been a few years. Uh, I, I played in Blue and Portland and all that, and there it was the, the silence treatment, and no one thought about it. I mean, of course, we knew that that and that was gay, but it wasn't discussed openly. So. That's why I'm here today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we have uh, quite many new role models in different sports, so that every kid knows that in the sports it's okay to yeah. be gay, whatever, and also in this and this and this and that's why there's still work to do. So we kind of be silent. But, yeah. Yeah, how can we get those role models? It's maybe the okay, next, next, next thing. <coughs> yeah, in this society. Yeah. Maybe more, just for people 
with other persons. I, I, it's, it's like, like we, we all should understand that there are things that you don't go to say to other person. Yeah. If you are like just in general. Like in yeah. general. Yeah. If I'm so evil them. that I want to hurt other person, yeah. it's not her or his fault. It's my fault. I have a problem. If my way of life is going around and insulting and harming persons, whatever is the reason, it has to be anything yeah. that we have been talking about. So. But I think that the most like a tricky part to deal with is not like me people that are hating like uh, others or something like that. It is like us. It is us. And the way that the language we use, the practices we participate in, that somehow without 
knowing it, mm -hmm. without knowing it. We participate in reproducing That's true. That's this true. culture. Mm -hmm. So it is not a bunch of mean people that mm -hmm. want to hurt others. It is us. We are the sports culture. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Too. And how to change that? Really, like uh, really, I don't, I don't know. But uh, I guess it's a starting point to start, like trying to become more aware of what are the small, the small ways that we ourselves are reproducing exactly. this stereotypes, for example. Mm -hmm. Like maybe it's just like starting with that. But uh, mm. really, it is, I think it is not just dealing with uh, if, if we want to do something, I have to start with myself. You have to start with yourself. You have to start with yourself. It's, we can't wait. That some other one will do something. Everyone has to start, start with her or himself. Well, I will continue on that, but what if, uh, I, I guess we're <laughs> not, <laughs> that we all think what concrete uh, we can do ourselves, what, what I can do personally, and then what your organization can do, what your, your uh, mm, can do, and some, some uh, uh, just to run down somewhere or think on the way home that's what, what actually can be done and what what's uh, one's responsibility on, on that. That's my suggestion. Yeah. As a homework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can take, take that with or have that in our minds. Um, this was an interesting discussion too and yes. As we said, there is so many, so many things and so many oh, different, different sports are different. So, so there is, isn't only one one thing we have to think about because we all are different. So it's, it's important things to think about and, and go through that. We had a nice discussion and I'm really, really happy that we had you guys here and, and also the audience and everyone. So I don't know if Lena wants to. <laughs> I was contacting many people to join us here for uh, audit committee, city, city, uh, of all uh, chiefs and, 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 uh, and more, more, more of the public personnel and also club uh, personnel from Hojiko and other uh, try to get them as well and go best. And, and what was encouraging to me that uh, the city worker, city legal Paulo and, and Olympic committee person said that oh you're such a big, uh, such a big topic, such an important topic. I'm so happy that you're doing this. And uh, that um, unfortunately my calendar isn't uh, uh, possible to join, but but uh, it, 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 to me it's just that, that 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 there's a real need for this kind of Conversations and, um, and yeah, try to get first. <laughs> yeah, right. One thing. First, I want to thank Lynn, uh, Linda, very welcome, and Linda, you can help me, and also you just. Uh, Pros medalist. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
and for the panelists.